And I'm also going to record. So we are now live, I believe. Um, okay. Elena, maybe can you just see if we're live while I'm introducing? Can you do a check? Hi, everyone. Welcome to our second day of graduate thesis at SciArc. And uh, graduate thesis represents the culmination of the Master of Architecture one and two curriculum. So all of the students that you'll see presenting their work today have been working on this project um, for a whole semester, the summer semester, which is 15 weeks. It was uh, two weeks shorter this year because of our shift to remote learning. Um, and they have also completed a thesis prep semester in the spring. So all these students will be graduating. We're gonna celebrate their graduation on Sunday. Um, and we'll be seeing, I believe four projects. Um, we'll be seeing Ziyu Xu, Kishti Bahende, Fomful Fomful Sinchai, and Wesley Evans. Um, the students have been, uh, some of them have been advised uh, by Elena Manfredini, who is our graduate programs chair. We're very happy to have Elena as our host as well. Um, and Hernan Diaz Alonso will be joining us and uh, one of my students. So you'll see a range of work from, from different advisor groups. And uh, we, each project we have um, 45 minutes and so to kick off uh, what we've been doing this year, just as a way to um, get all the students to kind of hear your voices right up front and hear about you is just to go around and please introduce yourself. Um, so I'm going to invite uh, Natu, please, to introduce yourself. Hello, I'm Natu Fall, a, a graduate of SciArc's MRF1 program. I'm currently a um, makeup artist and art director uh, here in Los Angeles. And uh, Donald Bates. Hey, Marcy. Um, I'm Professor Donald Bates. I'm the chair of architectural design at the University of Melbourne and a director of Lab Architecture Studios. And Patricia Molnick. Hi. I'm uh, Patricia Olenek. I'm the just stepped down from a 13 year term as director of the Graduate School of Art at Washington University in St. Louis. I am an artist. I collaborate with architects and I also run the New York Laser Program in New York, which is part of the Leonardo International Society for Art, Science and Technology Group. Um, and uh, very happy to be here today. And John McMorrow. Oh, John, you're muted. It was really awesome, my introduction. I think I'll leave it where it stands. <laughs> uh, my name is John McMurrah. I'm an associate professor at the Graduate School of Taubman College of the University of Michigan, and I write about contemporary architecture and its problems. And Juan Rincon. Hi, I'm uh, Juan Rincon. I'm a SARC graduate from the uh, Theory and Pedagogy program. Um, I'm the design principal of uh, Taller Paralelo here in Bogota, Colombia, and the head curator for uh, Voltaje, New Media Art. Thanks, everyone. And we'll be joined by Mimi Zager, who's also SciArc liberal arts faculty and a curator um, and writer. So without further ado, I think I will hand over to our first presenter, uh, see you. All right. Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Ziyu Zhu, and then let me share my screen. Okay. Wait. Uh, hi, uh, so my thesis is on the 3D printing concrete technology and then my thinking of how this technology and then all the other digital fabrication methods can change the future of our building process. So 
let's look at the things that we're doing right now. So the owner will get an architect to do something and then that will pass it down to engineers, to GC and the subcontractors. And then the subcontractor will find a worker to do it. And then after that, it's the whole process again. And then your architecture design is compromised and it's changed through all these different process. You might have looking really bad and then it's not what you want, but you have to live with it. But imagine this, if you can, the owner can just talk to the architect. The architect will do the design with the engineering consultant with the mind of how the final product will be in fabrication. And then after the design is set, you just send it to the fabrication like you do in your own 3D printer, in your own shop or in your own office. How amazing would that be? So all of this is based on the thinking of as long as there's less human factor, there's more control over your design. With that in mind, let's look at some of the stuff that's been done before. So let's start with the small scale. Uh, ETH has done this beautiful column series with the, with the 3D printer they have used. And then you can see the different waves and patterns that they created. It's very really delicate. And I'm looking at something a little bigger scale. So this is the team in Dubai. Uh, they did this huge structure that's in one of their plazas. And then you can see the complex walls that you can create it with this technology. And then looking back in the US, the ICOM team in Austin, this is one of the first uh, housing projects that's been done in the US soil. So you can see that it's, the technology is capable of printing a house, but there are like, I don't think they look good. But. And then also this is the team I've been working with. I have been working with for a long time. They printed this bridge uh, almost two years ago uh, in Shanghai. Uh, it's done by individual blocks and then uh, forming an arch. And then you can see in the middle picture, there's uh, like 200 people standing on top of it, which shows the structural capability of this technology. And then, so let's look at how, like simply now, uh, how we do a curve wall right now. Uh, you know, conventional measures, you have to do the molding and then you have, that's very labor intensive and then that's actually a very custom process. And then it costs a lot of money and then it spends a lot. Compared to, if you just print it, it'll be like done in like several hours. So uh, I'm creating a scenario to, solve, to do a little design proposal. So first of all, uh, we're in California, so we're picking this as a, uh, at the location. We'll do a rural neighborhood. We had a lot of spare lines and then additional housing because a lot of families want additional housing on their property to, to get more income or to just has, have their family and friends stay over. The current problem with California is that first of all, it's very seismic, earth, there's a lot of earthquakes. And then uh, with this, you want plumbing and electricity to be done really smoothly. But if you dig into the ground like, like usual, it defeats the purpose of being a fast building process. And then third, insulation, concrete is not a great insulation material. And then force a window, the concrete is not exactly transparent. And then five, due to the current like technology uh, boundaries, you can't really print uh, uh, horizontally. So the roof is something else that we need to be done. So let's look at the resolutions. So first of all, uh, earthquake plumbing and electricity, this can be solved by using the chassis, the mobile houses, and then like uh, trailer homes have been using for ages. So the house, so the chassis will incorporate all the plumbing and electricity, whilst the suspension that it's actually the wheels will uh, soften the earthquake. And the insulation wise, so when, when we're printing the concrete, we leave gaps in the middle like uh, in the middle picture. And then in those gaps, uh, insulation materials like aerogel or et cetera can be put inside to enhance the property of the concrete wall. And so window and roof, this will be just done by design. The windows will be uh, created by using gaps between the concrete walls and then opening skylights on top. And then while the roofs, uh, we're doing this two layering system where the inside layer will act as the uh, structural wall and then uh, white, uh, wood beams will go on top of that, create the roof, while the outside wall is uh, for aesthetic purposes. 
So this is a design proposal I've done. Uh, it's not for uh, any specific uh, function meanings. It's just a kind of a little bit showing off the uh, way that we can do designs with concrete. So you can have curved walls and then have wavy patterns. Well, do we are having the same kind of cost as a straight wall? So I print first of all, I printed a <clears throat> sorry, small scale model with uh, PLA uh, without using any support to just show this kind of shape can be printed without support. And then let's now let's do it in a larger scale. Well, in the beginning, I failed miserably. So in the beginning, we printed a huge long wall, and when we tried to move it, it cracked. So we have to cut the whole thing into a lot of several pieces. And after that, uh, it failed again. So that's because, as you see on the right, uh, right now the the technology is not there to print really uh, like really wide angles. So this one has a little bit of wide angle, wide, wide angle, so it, it falls on itself. So I have to change the design a little bit. And then here is a two pass uh, improve. And then yes, we did print in full scale. But oh, there will be a video showing that later on. Uh, here's the team that did it. Uh, huge thanks to them. I was uh, I was actually going to go back to China. Oh, by the way, it was printed in Wuxi, China. I was going to go back to with them and then to do design with them and then to do the whole printing process. But due to current situations, I wasn't able to. But it creates a very interesting opportunity as well. I will talk about it later on. So let's talk about cost in the beginning. So the walls uh, total length is 108 feet and then 3D printing costs. Uh, so let's run it down. So we use 6.4 tons of concrete and each ton of concrete costs $147. We use three labors. Uh, one of them is to control the robotic arm. Two of them is to move the materials around. And then labor cost in China is really cheap, $35 per day. But let's put the perspective uh, of US labor in as well like $120 per day to find one of the workers outside Home Depot. And then robot use time is 20 hours. And then the total like process cost uh, use of four days. So the total cost in China is like $1,300. And then in the US is $2,380. And then, but as I was talking in the beginning, if you use conventional methods using the mold and stuff, it's $120 per feet, and then it costs about 10 days. So the total cost will add up to be $30,000, uh, $30, which is a big difference, in my opinion. And so this is how I imagine this kind of tiny house printing process in the future could be. So first of all, you have a design by the architect. You go to uh, your engineer consultant, have them approve your design, and then come out with the two pass. And then you just send the two pass to the construction site. And then, so the truck will come with all the materials and equipment to the site. And then the whole production assembly is assembled, which is very simple. It's just applying the reels and then mounting the robotics. And then the robots will print the process, uh, print the whole building within like within a week. And after that, you have a, you have a tiny house which is a lot better than what we're trying to do right now using labor and then it takes forever and then you have to change designs because someone fucked something up. Sorry for my language. And then, yes. And then as, as I was saying, this unique COVID circumstances give a really unique experience for me. So I was in LA doing the design. Uh, the engineers was in Beijing approving my design and kept giving me the two pass. And then the production happened in Wuxi. But, you realize, you now realize something. All of these three dots can be anywhere in the world. So the designer can be literally anywhere in the world with internet access. And the engineers are the same. Uh, fabrication wise, as long as there is a, uh, a KUKA robotic uh, support in the area, which is what all major ma uh, car manufacturers are using, you can print over there. So basically anywhere in the world. Well, maybe not Antarctica. And then I do have a video showing the whole process. So you join us in the lab in Wuxi. Wow, this is a list, okay.
And then, yes, this is some of the failures. So we're printing each thing in small blocks and then put them together. This is one of the big blocks that failed. So we use, so what we use as concrete is not a conventional concrete that you buy at uh, Home Depot. It's actually a special mix. It's still uh, just thin sand, like six sand, and then and then uh, cement, but special additives are added to make the concrete fit the uh, requirements to print. And I hear the chemical reactions are happening with the added of the water. And starting the printing process, and you, so here you can see some of the fibers are within the concrete. The fibers are added to increase the tension capability of the concrete because, uh, as you well know, concrete does not perform well under tension. So these fibers are kind of add as substitute to the uh, re, uh, concrete, uh, steel rebars as always used. And then the nozzle here is a special design so that we can control the extrusion speed of the concrete depends on the moving speed of the nozzle. And then here you can see the gaps in the middle that I left for applying the uh, insulation materials later on. Uh, here are some of the time lapse of the smaller pieces. Uh, the rebars in the in the bottom are just for easy to move. It's it does not serve any structural purposes. And as you can see here, there is the color change between the top and the bottom. Uh, as the wall began to grow, that, that is the concrete starting to dry and then harden itself. It usually takes about uh, 15 layers for it to be uh, dry initially. And then, so in that way, the top of the wall added will not crush the ones in the bottom. But this is a really tight control process. And then it's done by the material research has been done. And yes, here we have the final thing. So the scale I printed this in is one to two. We were gonna print it in full scale, but then we realized we do not have enough land to put this thing on. So we decided to print it one and a half scale. So it's one and a 1.5 meters tall. I don't know how much feet I'm saying. That's in, and then it's 15 meters long.
Okay, and then that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Uh, Ziyu, is that how you pronounce your name? Yes. Could you just clarify, like, I think the project has lots of accomplishment, lots of beautiful moments, but I'm trying to understand, like, where the, where you would locate the heart of the research. Is it in the, the use of the robot to create the forms at that scale? Is it the sort of formal ramification of printing? Is it like as a kind of dwelling unit? You hit on a lot of things and I think they're all covered in a way, but I'm trying to find out like where the core of the interest for you is. Is it like offering up a new fabrication model which has to do with home delivery? Is it about the sort of workings of the technology? Is it this formal disposition? Like I'm trying to see where your, where your heart lies with this work. Yes. So this season's project actually came from a business uh, venture that I'm trying to overtake. Uh, uh, it's basically from a thinking of how we can print, well, how we can build cheaper and then faster. Because the trend I've been seeing here is that you bring, you build a very small house using wood and then using very bad labor and it still costs a fortune. And then so that's from where I started to research how we can use the current technologies to change the way we build. And then, I yeah, I mean, I just think as a presentation, I would have been interested in hearing you present the business model <laughs> as the result, because I have questions about like where the efficiencies of this lie. And I think presenting it as the business model would make it all super clear because at that point there would be sort of like deliverables because at the level of rhetoric, it's, it's literally a hundred year old argument. It's the argument Corb made about the domino structure, that this would make it more efficient and cheaper to build. And so like, it's a long argument that you find yourself in, which I think it's fine, but I, but I don't have like yet a sort of precision about where this will make the new efficiencies. And I think the business model just offers this great new lens by which we could maybe engage that. So what my thinking of this is that the technology is almost there to make it a viable business, but it's not there yet. Like what I'm trying to do is just piece together a lot of small pieces and then to advance it a little bit further. But I guess the, my point is what, po <laughs> there's a promise of like, oh, it'll just take a few minutes and the architect won't have to be bothered and the builders won't have to be bothered. But then when I see what you delivered to the site, I don't know, seems like there's going to be a lot of work weather tightening it. There's going to be a lot of work making the roof. There's going to be a lot of work building the chat. Like, I'm trying to understand more precisely the exact efficiency. And I just think the business model might be an interesting way into that, because then you have to, like, declare in a more definitive sense as opposed to, like, a general. Yeah, I still don't, like, yeah. It's, a, it's an enthusiasm for the project that I suggest the business model as a lens. Yes. Yeah, I agree, and I'll just make one comment because I, I, uh, I don't, I don't design buildings, but I have to say, you know, listening to you present this this um, model at the beginning made me think you're a real systems thinker, and also made me think about uh, the philosophy of tech uh, techno utopianism, right? This idea that technology is going to simplify everything. Uh, it's going to make life easier for humankind. It's going to provide access to things that uh, we wouldn't otherwise have access to. There's a real kind of utilitarian uh, and utopian idea behind this idea of techno -utopia, uh, utopianism. So, um, you know, maybe it's just simply a way of the way that you actually restructure your description of the of the project that um, situates it either closer or further away to techno utopianism. Because if you're interested in looking at the kind of the history of technology by way of the way a lot of things developed at say even MIT, you know, does do you believe the technology really uh, complicates things, necessarily complicates things? 
that it's a neutral force, it's a nefarious force, or in the in the eyes of the techno utopian utopian uh, followers, that in fact by way of technology we will make everything quicker, faster, and better. Um, these are the questions that uh, begin to percolate in my mind when I when I listen to your project and when I actually uh, see your presentation. So when I think about uh, well. I don't know the term you refer to, but I think I kind of understand it, is that uh, how does technology change our life? Does it make it better or does it make it more complicated? Well, I believe in, uh, in different circumstances because there are circumstances that technology are there to really simplify your life. For instance, I believe the construction process right now is really unnecessary. You really don't need a lot of contractors and some contractors to go through all the process and then to do the design. Because um, from, from what I understand, uh, the, the manufacturing industry has gone so much ahead of us. And uh, this is my way of trying to uh, make our industry catch up a little bit so that mm -hmm. we can have a better building, make it cheaper and make it faster and have a better design. And then from an architect's perspective, I, I was working in MAD for a while uh, as an intern and then the process of, uh, I was doing the design on the, uh, on the new, on the new Lucas Museum that's in Los Angeles. It's a very insanely cloud shape. And then I realized that the panels and basically everything is fabric, uh, is digitally fabricated. And that process is actually a lot more uh, controlled and then a lot simpler to do. And it does cost a lot of money right now, but with the development of technology, it will, the cost will, will come down because there's more production. And then I was, that's from, that's why I really realized that this is the future of how we build. We're not gonna have like thousands of labor just working on site and then it's a whole nightmare to control everybody and then to make everybody work in control and then have a human error all the time. I, but, say, I remember 20 years ago when Barak, he's a USC uh, researcher, he, I was working for Greglin at the time, and he came to our office to show us what he was doing, which was this kind of research. And his idea, again, was the utopian idea of creating a full house. And I remember clearly when I left, when he left the office, I looked at him and I said, well, wouldn't this be a great method of production panels? just in terms of curved panels. I mean, if you imagine mm -hmm. Los Angeles um, at the end of the uh, 90s, beginning of 2000, when there was a lot of emphasis in digital design, when Frenger was curving the panel. Um, and and, I, and I'm happy that you mentioned that. I mean, there is a production of architecture that goes through the custom panel. And I remember clearly thinking, why are you thinking about using this technology make the entire house, or to make the entire house on Mars, or to make the entire house a small house, but why can't we imagine this technology to make what we cannot make today unless we make mold? Which was truly, I think, I thought the, the, the moment of, of revolution, we can do certain things that we like to design or we like to see, we might not be aware of them, through methods that are not simply out there because the industry has been used to produce things mm -hmm. in a specific way that now is completely mainstream and the streamline makes it effectively um, efficient but what if you want to do certain different shapes then this becomes a way to make them. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the panels because I think the more you work in certain offices the more you understand the limitation of the industry, what kind of expenses we, and labor we put down in order to create certain things. Mm -hmm. Just, right. I, I meant to, if it's okay, just to, to jump in in terms of the, the degree to which this is a thesis, um, because uh, on the one hand, look, I, I mean, congratulations. I mean, you know, very few students uh, do a project that's built to almost scale or at least one to two scale. Um, and having the contacts and the links back to Wuxi and places to, to be able to get it fabricated and stuff, I think is really good. But what I'm missing, which for me would make it into a thesis as opposed to a project, uh, is a real critical examination of your premise and also the limitations of your premise. So for instance, 
you know, the you you give up, you know, I mean, a, an accurate description of current uh, construction processes, which are complex, many people involved, people doing different trades, it's sequential, there's a lot of wastage, there's a whole bunch of things that one can talk about. But you also then present a project which itself is so schematic that it never actually articulates where there might be issues. So for instance, you know, you talk about, oh, it's really difficult to put holes in this. So I can only have windows where I have a kind of overlap of walls, which is a limitation. So, you know, because you, you started this by saying, you know, because of the current construction process, it limits the imagination of the architect and it's always bastardized. You know, that, that the purity of an architectural design is somehow diminished when it goes through the construction process. And so you're looking at this as a way to liberate the pure essence of an architectural design to its fulfillment as a production. But then you say, but, oh, I can't put windows here, so I have to change my design. Oh, I can't have a curved wall because it's going to crack. Oh, I can't do a roof because that technology doesn't exist. You know, very simple things like, you know, you extrude all this. So where are you going to put in the electrical cables mm -hmm. and have a, a wall plug? Where are you going to, uh, you know, have put in the toilets and have uh, pipes and flues and chases and air conditioning and things like this? So the, the complexity of even the simplest regular small building uh, you know, I, to me, you have to do that as a comparative. And I guess the issue for me is that there's the, you set up a kind of straw argument about the complexity that you're fighting, you know, the complicated messiness of real construction that you're fighting against, but it's not a very accurate comparative analysis. So we could start to understand where the issues lie and where they have to take place. I mean, I do think that John's uh, proposition that really this is about a business model um, mm. would change it, but that would be a very, then it would be, wouldn't be really about what the building looks like. It wouldn't be question if it's a sexy architecture or not. It would be irrespective because the one thing your building would not allow is a very uh, uh, orthogonal building with mm -hmm. really nice sharp corners. You know, so if I have, if I have an architectural aesthetic that demands really crisp, sharp corners, it doesn't do it. On the other hand, what it does do, which you didn't really talk at all about, is the difference between just an extruded uh, wall or where you start to articulate the wall with these sort of facetings and cuppings, which become really, I mean, that's an amazing sort of uh, quality, but you didn't even mention it as if it was a desired effect. Uh, so again, I think as a thesis, you would have to go much further than just being uh, congratulating yourself for achieving it, which I congratulate you for achieving it. But at the same time, I don't think it really pushes in terms of articulating what can be done, what can't be done. Why would you do it this way? Why would you not do it this way? Mm -hmm. And what effects can you achieve that you can know you can't achieve any other way? I would, I would, um, I would echo on the on the comments in the sense that I feel that um, there's like a general uh, confusion a little bit on the um, on the sharp aim of your of your research and so on. Whether is it it is a a business model and the way you present it, or is it just uh, you insist a lot on the sort of comparison of. Uh, if we could call it typical house and how this becomes better, no, leads you to better uh, design uh, that we would have to sort of uh, frame as well and question how, how can we uh, relate to that sense of better. Um, you're also very acute on the sense of, uh, of uh, creating this idea that um, this sort of system in a way is sort of uh, withdrawing all the contractors but that you normally have which I could question that, uh, as Donald said, uh, you would always have uh, plumbing, you always have elect electricity and so on. And I guess in a sense, uh, you will have new contractors. Uh, so the idea of um, diminishing the contractors, uh, actually I, what I do feel is that they mutate, but also 
uh, something that's really interesting about it, your project is that uh, you um, you have the knowledge of how the system works. Uh, you have the possibilities to test it, to actually build it, which is uh, quite impressive. Uh, nevertheless, I'm not sure that if um, if this knowledge is sort of aimed to a critical way of understanding how this. Uh, possibilities for concrete printing can actually make certain changes or be better eh, as opposed to building more complicated in a way structures no I, I i feel there's a lot of potential around this uh, uh, let's say new mediums in the seriality seri no they're able to um, to produce uh, and in that sense when you start thinking this in a more reproductive scheme no uh, um, and and sort of crossing it with time, you no, know, and with cost and with money, uh, then you really start making shift uh, shifts that I feel, uh, in my opinion, can make actually different projects, you no, know, as opposed to the typical house, the typical house in a way you can build um, anyway. But certain uh, things for uh, let's say. Um, sort of fast architecture, either being for refugee camps or for events or so on. Uh, there's a silly seriality um, and a really fast pace that all these uh, mediums are able to evolve into. So I, may, I, I, do, I did feel a little bit um, missing that part of the discussion, uh, missing that part of the critical analysis of how can we push this um, sort of very innovative method into doing things that are not yet been done, no? Uh, the extraordinary small home could be done in different ways. Uh, and in a way, this idea that you can do it anyway in the world and you can be anywhere, it's a bit questionable, no? There are certain geographies that require uh, the way of acting with certain local materials or so on. So, um, just rounding up the, the argument, uh, well, uh, I insist it's very impressive to see that. I think this is, although I think it's a research that lacks a little bit, that focus did leave you uh, something quite interesting, which is, uh, well, that experience of building um, a model that big. Yes. Uh... So, because this, as this season has been like the direction has been kind of changing throughout the whole process. I did, I, from my beginning, I was just going to do a pure design and I'm going to try and build it. Like that's what my thinking was. But then I realized that this technology can bring a lot of uh, thinking and a lot of potentials. So, I, I yes I I do agree that this is kind of little bit lacks some of the uh, deep research and then and then kind of exploration of what's the like the fundamental like direction and then what's the fundamental changes it can create. Yeah, I do agree with that. I think I mean I I appreciate the work and and reflecting on all of these comments. I think in terms of the genre of a thesis, it's a little bit like missing a subject position. So I'm not sure, like this is where, is, is it from the business point of view? Is it like from the PM point of view, the project management aspect? Is it from the design perspective? It's sort of all of these things. And so when it's pointed out that like one problem is answered by another discipline and it sort of ricochets back and forth. And so one's never clear like what motivates what. I think that you know the accomplishment of the fact is a kind of uh, an effort of yeah of real accomplishment to like get it built and do arrangement and I think there's a sort of um, contractors not a contractors but a sort of like logistical acumen that's clearly taken place here that's like quite impressive. I just want to point out I like form and I like talking about buildings so I just want to point out that like the two buildings you show the second one is so much better than the first one. And I think it just has to do with like the fact that the second one seems to figure out a way around your aperture problem that answers some of the previous examples where you see the walls being extruded up and then it has to get capped. 
and you start to figure out, well, I could make the roof a little bit smaller and I could make an opening a little bit easier. And, and I think that's like a comparative disciplinary approach that could be underlined in the work in a way that would be really helpful to understand. I think, you know, I would go back to Donald's comment about like comparative approach. You know, I think to take those precedents and show how you're pushing it and moving the ball forward, even if it's only a few feet, would be a really good way to position it as opposed to like, this is going to change everything. Because from my recollection, everything changes everything all the time. So <laughs> we can't depend on that like revelation, but we can like demonstrate a kind of like potential enacted in the work, which I, which I think you've done. So what I'm trying to say is no, this is not the, this technology right now can change everything. I, I was talking about uh, how I think uh, the whole building situation could change and then this can be just a piece of the puzzle that can go within it. For instance, like before we come build complex walls with uh, wavy patterns, and now there is a possibility that we could and then do it in a relatively cheap manner and then fast manner. Like that, that's kind of what I'm trying to say, but I guess I didn't present that really clearly. I guess, I'm sorry to manipulate the conversation. You presented that super clearly. You said that like a million times. I guess I want another answer to a different question. Like this makes a different kind of form for the dwelling based on the fabrication. This gives us a different delivery method. This changes the way we think about uh, inside and outside based on our value because of the way this thing is thermally conductive. Like there's other vectors that this could elucidate. Generally faster, better, cheaper. I don't know. I don't think it's very compelling because that's every argument all the time. Hmm. Zee, I'd like to return to the question of the rhetoric uh, behind the project because I, I was sort of taken off guard. There, there was kind of an informal delivery that I, I almost started to think is this kind of a performance, you know, the way that you talked about it and even some of the, the video that's shown. And again, I, I would, I would um, echo the comments about the achievement of actually building this, of actually 3D printing this prototype at that scale is fantastic and very commendable. And just that as a whole project of how to orchestrate that also during this time where you're located remotely and you can't be on site. And so I think there's a whole discussion there as well about logistics and how the architect operates today and maybe the agility with like how we need to adapt to some of these emerging situations and technologies that, you know, just the, where we're sitting now in the Zoom space in March, none of us knew about this. So I think all those things, I, I would say, you know, that's great, but I, I wish that you had taken the time to then really think about how to deliver that the thesis, like, because I'm still, I agree with the others. I'm sort of still looking for that question or that hypothesis, not just about realizing the prototype and the economy of that, but what it means as a student who's enrolled in thesis to produce such a work and then present it in the academic context and how that might be different from how you would present that to uh, someone, a client or a developer or someone like that. And I, I, I think it's really important because thesis is really about articulating a position both through your work and through your words, or maybe it's not even necessarily words, but the way in which you package, like I, you could have almost done a performative thing like welcome to my office. Cause I was even asking Elena in the sidebar chat of, you know, do you already have an office? Cause as you were talking about this, I thought maybe like you, you were already launched your practice and you're still in school. And so I just, I, I think that you would have benefited from trying to kind of fold some of that thinking into how you deliver this argument and this position and who your audience is. Yes, that, I've been trying to think about it as a, uh, as a business too much that I, I do kind of um, lack the kind of uh, academic uh, setting and then to, uh, to present it in a uh, more academ academia way that I, I realize that now, but 
But I just want to say something though, because I I actually enjoyed that that was not there. I mean, I've been teaching at SAR for 18 years, and I think there are maybe only two theses that I can remember. One is yours, and one was five years ago. It was about a column and how to think about the column and technology behind it. We're not really the school that takes on either a methodology of production nor um, a technical research. I mean, this at ETH would probably find is complete grounding and probably also the kind of um, research that happens in the institution to be able to uh, propel this. Um, but I thought maybe it's more important to do it rather than finding a critical position uh, for certain things that are, I think, still in the making and they're far from being perfect. But then is the amount of times you make that thing that actually creates a step forward. I don't know, I just, in terms of being an educator and having to work with students, I think what I appreciated was actually the level of veracity almost towards the construction that not often you see. I mean, at the end of the day, we, we produce um, and phenomenal designers and sometimes phenomenal theses. And I will show afterwards in the green room how many of our theses students became uh, actually teachers afterwards. I mean, I, I put together a small conversation with Hernan, I'm glad you're here. And I actually went through 15 years of thesis and finding how many of our students after thesis brought that into their academia. I think Z is not that student, um, but he will probably have a much more professional practice ahead of his. And I, and I thought it was interesting to me, almost refreshing that he would go all the way to the end of this. I mean, that there is something also to be said about bringing this to the end. I mean, whether or not there are failures, whether or not it's not one-to-one -one scale, whether or not there are no windows. <laughs> so so there, are, there are issues clear, and I think he, he's very aware of all of them, and those are discussed. Is um, Also, I think it's, it's an issue of what this technology is good at doing. And I was, um, two days ago, there was a show of um, additive, additive uh, technology applied to furniture, and suddenly, yes, there are phenomenal capability of 3D printing now being applied to multiple projects, but then it's still how many make, can you make in a certain amount of time, which is going to be always the limitation of, of the technology. Whereas when you think about making buildings, actually, those limitations are less important. And I, I actually do share the faith that that would be a technology that is a few steps away, but it, it will happen. I mean, it will happen. And I think uh, if the thesis enters, it enters in a weird time. So it's not, there is always a point of entry in, in, in an idea. Clearly the point of entry of Z is not the one of the invention because that has been invented before. It's a setup that somehow is already there. Um, I don't think uh, it's easy to invent all the time and he is very aware of that. So he acts on it like as a designer that does the first experiment with the technology, with all the limitation that that carries with it. Right. Elena, I have to agree. I think, um, you know, I find that there's like multiple approaches to thesis and at SciArc, you know, graduate thesis is considered your first project in um, your career as an architect, as a designer, etc. And for me, I find that uh, Z, your project, you sort of used thesis as the opportunity to really just do your first experiment in, you know, this business model that you have sort of envisioned or planned. Um, and I think that's, you know, commendable. And I think it's, you know, a different take on, on what an architectural thesis is, but I, I still think it's, um, you know, absolutely valid, even though it's lacking the sort of critical, you know, academic um, aspect. And then, by the way, there is a shameless plug. Uh, we are doing this as a business, and then we have already signed a few contracts with uh, developers in Boston and then here in LA. Uh, we are doing small scale at first because this technology is not proved to build a building yet. I don't want to get into lawsuits, but we are ready to print uh, benches, uh, uh, like platters, and then anything that is a like a uh, like, like the scale within like four meter by four meter by four meter, anything that's interesting shaped and then you want it done cheaply and then you have an interesting texture. Yes, here's the are shape. You looking for, are you looking for investors or I mean? 
Well, well, what is the pitch? What is the pitch? We may regret it two years from now. We didn't invest on it. Yeah, that, that, that would be really welcome. <laughs> we, have, we have some partners here that's really good at uh, marketing. So, <laughs> how does this? How does this? Uh, Sorry, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, just following up very briefly on on a lot of the comments, which are urging you to sort of be a little clearer on articulating your position. I would, you know, again, I would re-emphasize, you know, the reason I'm bringing up techno utopianism is not for you to go completely into speculative fiction or something like this, but because a lot of these ideas were really driving early ideas at MIT that linked art, science and technology. And so, you know, I just sat through two years of meetings as part of the planning committee for our new building on our campus. We just did a whole renovation of the East End and, um, and the architects that ignited the imagination of all of us as, you know, the clients were the people who could, who could really articulate something beyond the kind of rote description of what it means to build a building. And so I think what's coming out in this panel is like, again, which audience, right? I don't, I'm not part of the school, so I'm not, I'm not in a position to say how you should articulate something within the school for your thesis project necessarily, but simply to say that those larger ideas that have been the driving forces in culture are, are things that are important to name and, and how you attach yourself or don't attach yourself to some of these precursors, I think is going to be really, really uh, important. So my two cents coming from the perspective of, of uh, outside the thesis class. <laughs> Any last comment? Because we have, we just have a couple minutes. Mm -hmm. I, I just wanna say a word about criticality because I always have this um, discussion, especially when I talk to colleagues that teach in, in schools that are um, in, in other countries and other continents and they discuss and they criticize actually the United States for being critical all the time and criticism not being able to produce something whereas lack of criticism sometimes actually enables some action or some change and actually it allows certain work to be done and I, I, I just think that sometimes we lose the capacity uh, in this um, in this field to, to, to go until the end of a dream um, and make that real because we are critical about what that means. And I, on the one hand, I'm completely for the, and, and I am a very critical person in general, and I am completely uh, almost critical and, and problematic way that architects have to relate to their own work. When I find that the other end, the ability to set aside the criticism and say, this is still worth doing, and I'm gonna believe this until the end of it, I find that, <laughs> Very important to create some progress, actually. But certain academic secrets do not allow certain things to happen. So I just want to say this because um, I had the same issue the entire semester, but on the other hand, at the same time, the desire to let that go so that something could come to play, something this scale could exist. Wait, I, I, that's too tempting an, an offer. Who said criticality? Because I don't know who let criticality in the room. Because I just want to say, like, I think it's different. The difference between being propositional and critical is the key distinction that I would want to make here. I think the work is great. I think it could have been looked at and recounted. What did you learn? Turns out I need to do panels instead of one pour because I can't do it. That would be a fantastic way to conclude this presentation. That's not critical. That's just like sort of reflective and and positioning the work in some kind of framework where it can go forward. And so I think that's what kind of needs to happen tomorrow. Like even for, and that's why the business plan is a proposition about the future. And so I think it's great that he did all this stuff. I'm behind it. I just think like, oh, there needs to be some moment of like reframing and that can be post facto. It doesn't have to be like, and frankly, this notion of like, I'm going to change the construction paradigm I don't know, like <laughs> that's criticality's like crazy brother. <laughs> I, I think he could have just said like, look, I worked on some panels. Mm -hmm. I could build them really big, but not bigger than this. And so it turns out I had to like readjust. I think that's fantastic. So I just want like more specification of the insights mm -hmm. to like move the project for, for everybody. Mm 
I think that's different than criticality. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I would I would say positioning or even I mean some of the words that yeah about how you project into a future like even telling a story of who might inhabit that house mm -hmm. or something I mean that that's where when I say positioning I would totally agree with John I don't think it has to be critical discourse mm -hmm. at all I think we're kind of beyond that and I think searching for alternatives to the critical project is something that's been ongoing and you know here are some answers to that which is great and it's fantastic Ziu, that your project brings up this discussion. It's absolutely, incredible. absolutely. Positioning, articulating, framing, and with a with an you know a nod to the fact that nothing is ahistorical, and that you periodically give a nod to some of the the broader movements that are driving contemporary culture in the built environment today. I mean, I think it's yeah, no criticism. This is a fantastic project and uh, yeah, how you speak about it and articulate it moving forward, it will, it will be all the much more rich from this set of conversations. So thank you and congratulations to you. Thank you. And we're gonna move on uh, to Kishti Mahende, who is advised by Hernan Diaz Alonso. Yeah. And there's a possibility that my video and audio might lag because of the connection issue, but apologies if it does lag. Hi, I'm Shitij, and I'm working on my thesis, The Ugliest Architecture. The relationship between art and design is often misunderstood, and although a design outcome can be artful, the process behind it is altogether very different. What makes a design great? Is there a design that can be hated by everyone subjectively? Can we come to a conclusion of an ugly design collectively? I've set a series of examples using some of the iconic architecture buildings by redesigning them by adding or subtracting a simple change. Understanding and applying the changes in elements like scale, color, texture, alignment or form of the designs. A single change in the following can cause a drastic difference in the aesthetic judgment by the user. The purpose of this thesis is to understand these factors, their application, and to set an example of a building that is not supposed to be designed. By exploring ugliness, we could vaccinate ourselves against the pretentious architecture that could rise up in the future. I started the design process by chalking down the list of elements that contribute to making a building. The doors, windows, wall facades, roof, staircases, etc. Since aesthetic and ugliness is purely a subjective term, I used more of my own intuitive feelings while deciding selecting the elements. This process was inspired and similar to the elements exhibit by Rem Kulas. I have used the process of excavating the architectural unconsciousness. The scenario is similar to monstrous coupling of elements, orifices out of which emerges the inappropriate brutal juxtapositions and bizarre penetrations. I have used primary geometrical shapes and collaged them in an absurd format. I then assembled them in a more cacophonic method with contrasting elements, forms, textures being placed next to each other, resulting into an architectural cacophony. The absence of predictability in the form, texture, scale, color, and the nature is what results into adding the ugly element to the design. That being said, the new Capitol is a regular functioning federal building, retaining programs similar to its previous version. The ground floor of the Capitol is open to the public, consisting of spaces such as exhibition hall, gift shop, library, and the cafeteria.
with the president's latest idea of making the federal buildings beautiful again by renovating and redesigning the deconstructivist and brutalist architecture i propose this as a new design for the capitol located in washington dc Hi, I'm Shiti. Um, thank you. And just to make it clear, the main focus of the thesis is not inside of the building, but the facade. The inside of the building is just to give a rough idea that it functions from inside as well. Um, that's pretty much it. Yeah. You're going to run the animation and we're going to talk now? Uh, yeah, it's just on the loop. I'll, yeah, okay. we can start discussion on the. My first question is, can you sort of speak on how, like the, the definition you're giving the term ugly? Um, are we sticking to like the conventional thinking, like just anything visually undesirable or... Um, did you sort of give it another um, sort of definition for yourself while working? I mean, um, I'm aware that there can be like various ways and methods to create ugliness in the designs. Mm -hmm. But um, the way I've chosen is architectural cacophony. Cacophony is a musical te technique that combines different noises and overdoing something. Using that technique, which I applied in architecture, which you can see in the design. Basically, overdoing something with highly contrast and uh, right. monstrous overdoing something, yeah. And so, I think it's very interesting. And I'm looking at this redesign of the Capitol. And the first thing I wanted to ask of this was like, well, what is the decorum of the building? And I don't mean decorum just because it's the Capitol, but like, I don't know, buildings, classical, but all sorts of buildings follow certain sort of decorums. And you say the cacophony then releases it from, we could say, forms of decorum into some other thing. Does it offer anything? Does it operate only as a negative or is there a affirmative value of cacophony? Does cacophony instruct as well as it disallows? Like I'm, try I'm trying to figure out how you compose or is the compose a negation of the existing. And this is goes back to your initial examples where we see a building we recognize and then you change some vector of it, which then gets described as ugly. Although in some of the cases for me, it was like, comme si, comme ça, <laughs> which one was the ugly and which one was the good. Right. So I'm trying to understand, this is this is back to the earlier question from uh, Natu, just about like, well, if you're not gonna define ugliness, can we talk about cacophony then as a kind of, Right. Is itself a kind of decorum or a kind of set of principles? Um, so when I designed the, with the respect that the facade of the building is ugly, but the inside and the functioning, the program of the building from inside, it's functionable just like the regular capital. And the cacophony is used to create the ugliness, which you can see in the facade happening. A languageless yeah. way of designing, you can say. But doesn't that that question? I mean, it seems to me that, I mean, again, you're not really defining ugliness, but it 
good. The question for me would be for who? For whom is it ugly? Because I can name you a few architects that would not find this <laughs> ugly at all. In fact, um, that's exactly the kind of work they do. So I'm the question, sure. you know, what who who is the audience that you're making it ugly for? Right. And I think sort of to echo on Donald's point, um, given the like sort of you need to sort of explain who the audience is, because just looking at the materials you've decided to put together, the color choices you've made, there's an entire sort of um, culture of owning ugliness, right? Or the ugly that um, is like, this is exactly like in that camp or in that sort of um, culture. I mean, most of, most of that's mostly like on social media. But I'm looking at this and I'm like, I could think of people that um, would love this. And I personally don't find it ugly either. I'm more intrigued about like, like what Donald said, like who is this for? And also like, what is it about how you've chosen to combine these, these forms and these sort of um, features that, that speaks to sort of the, the ugly that you're trying to um, define here or, or um, sort of elucidate. Uh, yes, the idea of the project initially was inspired by the president's comments over the de deconstructivist architecture. Although during the process of designing, I carried it to a very subjective level. That being said, ugliness being subjective. Right, but that, that doesn't answer sort of who were you designing this for? Like when, when, like who are you imagining is going to look at this building and be like, oh my God, that's hideous. Or, oh my God, that's ugly. Like who were you designing this for? Just the general public or? General public, yeah, general public. Okay. Okay. I'd like to um to uh, jump to um to a relationship uh, towards the idea of a uh, cacophony. I mean, in the sense that uh, what we are seeing is it a sort of experiment around the idea of visualizing a cacophony, no? Which is merely a um, sound. Uh, is it following or is it trying to follow in a way the procedure or the sort of protocol that creates a cacophony, uh, because to a certain degree, there are different types of cacophony, you know? Um, it's not just the, let's say, the clash of very different instruments, but you can create uh, cacophonies within families of similar uh, frequencies, you no, know? and so on. So uh, in that sense, uh, in that sense, uh, cacophonies can be, um, very much a variation of different forms, whereas they can end up being very erratic, uh, uh, homogenous sounds, no? And in that sense, uh, I feel that within your explanation and, and maybe this confusion or discussion between the ugly or the not and what's ugly and what not, um, relating it to a cacophony seems to be a, quite a smart and interesting way. But nevertheless, uh, I do feel within your explanation, it's uh, kind of very superficially um, discussed. Uh, and in that sense, I'd like to know, like in a, um, to a more uh, deep sense, uh, how does this actually relate uh, to all the different possibilities of cacophonies, which at the end are quite uh, fascinating themselves? Uh, to be honest, I have not divided the cacophonies further into levels that it's in my design i applied the general term and meaning of cacophony so there's no a subdivision of cacophonies in the design as you can see can you speak to how like the order you've the sort of system you have going on in terms of how you've combined these things because like looking at this this sort of front elevation, I'm reading like a grid, even though it might be like a little bit loose, there's still like a type of order. I'm, I'm curious as to how you sort of went about like positioning these um, 
forms in relation to each other um the whole idea of positioning the forms is basically making sure the same forms textures and there's no repetition and harmony in the designs that is the main shapes forms textures colors you see don't repeat next to each other in a uh, predictable way so whatever i have designed in such a form is very unpredictable or super absurd and there's no order to it so how do you know when you've done it enough so i mean how do you how did you end up stopping i guess is my question I mean, is it is it just a question of time? You run out of time, and the reviews are at a certain date, so you have to say this is it. Now I have to figure out the plan and do some of the uh, sections and so on and so forth. I mean, in in the sense that if 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 it's about an accumulation and you call it the cacophony, the question is, could there be more? And, and what 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 would be the process of making it even more cacophonous? Uh, to the point, and, and and then I guess the the, the question that that for, to a certain degree comes out of that is, is there a point at which you actually get control of the process to the point that you know what effects you can achieve um, in in doing it? So as opposed to it just being, as you said, a kind of uh, personal uh, uh, subjective uh, uh, accumulation. Uh, testing out things at a, a certain point that you realize that a certain degree of juxtaposition, a certain scalar overlay produces more of the effect you're trying to achieve, or is it uh, you just try it and see and say, oh, that looks nice, and which becomes interesting because at the moment you say, oh, well, that looks nice, that looks right, then you've actually produced a kind of aesthetic order to it, which I would suggest it sounds counterintuitive to the notion of the ugly. Right. Yeah, that's right. That was a very challenging task to design something that is not ugly because since first year of our architecture school, we are oriented towards designing beautiful. So designing something that is breaking the hierarchy, monotony, or predictability is quite a challenge to it. And I think this design can, if added certain elements, this can be added and grow, grown further into as much as it wants. Like the reason I stopped is, I think I was done with it in a subjective way. <laughs> I thought it was complete at the moment. I, uh, I have a quick. I'm sorry. No, go, go ahead, John. Um, I don't know. This might be the same question, <laughs> just in a different word. <laughs> I'm watching the video. It does seem like a cacophony. I, I would say ugly in a non-pejorative way. Like it has aesthetic qualities that are, you know, probing certain limits. I'm literally shocked how big it is. Mm. And I guess I just want to say like, why am I shocked? Like, not that you have to like read my subconscious, but I think the reason I'm shocked is because I really thought it was a house. And then I see it take over the the, you know, it's multiple, multiple times, it's literally big, but it's also scale is quite big. And so I want to, I want to know from your perspective, like does scale function on the same plane of comparison as ugly and, or is it a different kind of thing? I would say it might be different. Yeah. I it think involves I, the body and involves another set of criteria that would have to be engaged. Sorry. Oh uh, yeah. I think scale plays a vital importance in the design. And the monstrous effects helps in making it ugly. And when I tried to shorten the scale, it was looking kind of, I would say, cute category of a design. Mm -hmm. But the monstrous and the enormous scale of the design is a deliberate element that I've used and helps in adding the ugly factor. Mm -hmm. But one thing I will say, John, um, and good to see all of you. Good to see you, John. Um, I want to circle back to something that you said at the beginning about the decorum. And I think something that Shatish mentioned very quietly about that the, the project also, in his own thing, took an interesting dimension when, when, when Trump came with the guidelines for federal buildings. Mm -hmm. So I think the issue of, of what you were talking about, the scale of the monstrosity, which I think Shatish mentioned, is an interesting one because mm -hmm. I, I, I always have this simple belief if you take whatever you do and you make it small it becomes like he said cute and you take whatever mm -hmm. you do and you make it big and becomes some kind of disturbing 
But I will think on this notion of the, the notion of the decorum and the provocation of that and what, what it constitutes, uh, what is a decorum of a federal building and, and the idea to, I mean, like, I, I really got excited when he decided to put, to replace mm -hmm. the Capitol building with this. I think to me, the, the thesis took a whole different dimension mm -hmm. because at the beginning, there was no predetermination where, what, what will be the deployment of it. So I think, uh, it was, mm -hmm. I mean, I think at some moment, I, I'm not saying it was a house at one point, Shatish, but there were a different scales yeah. of it. Uh, but I think that uh, what you were saying, John, about the mm -hmm. decorum, I think it's a super interesting issue um, and, and for you, Shatish, to think about it in terms of what that means and, and to understand in terms of those rules. I mean, um, not that the decorum doesn't relate to aesthetics, but the decorum also imply other things, right? Uh, and I think this goes a little bit with, with not to what you're asking, who this is for. Right. You know what I mean? So, and, and I wonder, and I wonder again, because COVID and protests and so on, how we filter all this, the relation that we have with federal buildings and buildings that represent power and what that means. Um, I'm, I'm not really offering any any particular insight. I just, I just interested in circle back to that notion of the current uh, uh, and the, those guidance of a federal building and what it means in terms of reestablish what and what are the orders of that. Um, and, and, and I think that mm -hmm. the for me, the scale, it was. I think, Shatish, if this wouldn't be a much more domestic project, I don't think we'll be having the same conversation. So I think that was a ballsy move, and, but I think it was the right move. Yeah, I would agree. I also think the question for me of scale, I just want to underline, and I don't think anybody's saying this, is not also just size, but the relationship of the elements one to another. So this window that we're seeing right now at the front, which is the sort of like cut out atrium window, without other cues, I think most of us would assume that's about 40 feet. Like the mullion space, like there's certain, there's, there's actual manipulations of sizing that I think are taking place in the building that like are about like its scale or its size, which is ginormous. But also like the relationship of the building parts is, I don't know, discount, uh, yeah, it doesn't align with expectation. And, and it's not like they're uniformly scaled, they're actually differentially scaled, um, which I think, I don't know, the Trump thing is interesting because it just like underlines something that I think might always be there. Trump makes it obvious that there's a decorum and classicism and that's all easily associated with. And it helps us to see like, oh wait, there was always a decorum to buildings or usually a sort of default that we could then probe. Um, so I think it's, you know, not only the sort of form and size, but also there's a tectonic implied with this that makes much smaller sets of decisions along its surface than I think you've kind of talked about yet, but I think is sort of the accomplishment of the project. Exactly, John. Sort of my question was going to be, um, just about that, you know, these like decisions that have been made in terms of like how all of these things are in relation to each other, I think hasn't been touched on. And I, I think as much as um, you're, you're saying there isn't an order, you just sort of put these together. There is one and I would encourage you to sort of take a step back and really look at the project and try to understand your own sort of um intuitive process and you know sort of maybe turn that into a system where you could continue to like build on on this technique that you've developed yeah but in, but in a certain way i mean i mean I, I i mean i'm interested in that as well but i it, it almost feels like uh i mean that's where I, it would have been interesting to see like 10 versions of this uh, to be able to not not so much because it becomes a methodology of production, but I almost feel that it's because it is a kind of assemblage and a concophony that it almost doesn't matter what the elements are, and it's not about getting better at it, because it, you know in a certain way this is not about uh, finesse and expertise. It's almost about confounding each time you do it, confounding the expectations in order for it to create a greater and greater effect. And the effect I think is, is interesting in terms of talking about, quote unquote, the, the audience or who is it for? Because, you know, I think the proposition that it's the US Capitol 
yeah, 99.9% of people would say, oh yeah, this is really ugly. How could you possibly imagine it? But at the same time, exactly because it is the capital, then it, it emits a kind of uh, political referentiality, which says that people that are really upset with what the capital stands for and what the, the Congress and the political institution stand for, we say, no, this is a perfect a anecdote to, to that condition. So actually there's a lot of people that do like this. So, you know, if, if the idea is to make the ugly is to create, engender a sense of rejection or, or distaste, then at the same time, exactly because of where you've placed it, uh, it actually engenders support because it stands in opposition to the thing that the element uh, wants to be about. So I think, I, you know, for me, that's interesting in terms of uh, taking on the role of a kind of political commentary uh, uh, as, as engendering or garnering some support for what should be repellent. Yeah, I think it being a political building subconsciously helps to vision our perspective to look at it in a more ugly way than it being a house or a different installation, urban installation or something. Mm -hmm. So yeah, political, being it being capital was a deliberate decision making it look more ugly. I think returning to the discussion of decorum, another word that we could think about would be appropriate. Like how because uh, yeah, there are many who would say, oh, that's not appropriate for a capital building. Um, and I think what's really provocative is that you are sort of almost like reappropriating that um, architectural language, that space, uh, that site. And I would love to see, I mean, I'd love to see what the interior looks like or even just a plan or section would be um, really informative in terms of how things will take place differently. I mean, I think you were saying it should function the same way, but I would argue that your project could radically sort of change the way that things function and sort of some of the assumptions that we have. And because I was surprised you kept the plinth, I would have maybe not kept the plinth and I would have allowed your um, design work, your kind of cacophony to also begin to inform how the building sits on or in the ground or above the ground or like what is that relationship to ground um, which I think is so important also in terms of how the public might engage with this how lawmakers engage with it how, you know the different how demonstrators might engage with it that the presence of your new building is it's a real activator for like, it would really transform the way we, you know, where, how do we enter? It looks like we might enter from the side. Um, but I also appreciate the fact this was brought up. There is uh, some kind of um, order to it. It's almost like it has a tripartite structure. I mean, there's, there are certain kind of nods to uh, the classical models that it's questioning in. And I think that's a really smart um, approach, a really intelligent way to deal with that. So did you did you consider? I mean, is it intentional that you did not show any any indication of like interior organization, or was that more a matter of time? Or yeah, the next step of the project would be to focus on the interior spaces. But the primary purpose of the thesis was to focus on the facades and the outer materials, exterior of the building. Mm -hmm. And if given more time, I would work on the interiors and the function interior spaces and inside functioning of the building. So yeah. I have a question. And, oh, one last thing is, I think that the, the question of the ugly and that's who began with it, like really saying, well, why, how are you defining ugly? Um, and maybe it's about either really fully going in there and owning that and sort of looking at some of the discussions about the ugly, like Mark Cousins has a whole text that he wrote about the ugly, um, which was written at another time. And again, like what's our discussion today about ugly versus beautiful, or you could say swerving away rather than making claims for how we should see this, kind of allowing allowing us to see it without already defining, like you're gonna be seeing an ugly project. And maybe that doesn't really get, that label doesn't get placed on at the outset. Um, Cause I think there are other words that might describe it. Um, I find it quite appealing. I, I yeah. yeah. 
I, I agree. Um, my question was going to be um, sort of, I want to hear more about your decision making process in terms of deciding which was going to be the front facade. Because I feel like this building, it like the sort of effects really operate um, in the round, right? So, um, you know, why are we seeing this face as the front elevation rather than like the other side or the back? Um, or... The process of deciding that was absolutely instinctive or intuitive. And I did not have a reason, justification, calculation or like a math to it. So yeah, there's no reasoning why that is the front facade. That mm. was very intuition based. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna push you on that just because I feel like of all of the, like of all the faces, it seems like that side reads a little bit more two dimensional, right? Than the other ones. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's a more flat surface if considered compared to the other facades. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I, don't know. I, I, I want I want you to go. I want you to like think about all of this and and everything that you think is like an intuitive, instinctual decision. Like, write down why, <laughs> and that's your answer, right? Because it it isn't. I mean, as designers and as architects, like obviously having design intuition is a big part of what we do. But I think like especially during your thesis, like make like decisions and sort of work on your your project in an intuitive way or in an instinctual way but when it comes to your presentation I feel like that's when you need to sort of give reasonings to things right like even if yeah. it was intuitive like what in your into like what in yourself made you make that decision right because yes. like you have an eye you clearly like there's decisions that were made for particular reasons you're just not either like you're you haven't thought of them yet or or you want to keep that to yourself for some reason but yeah um, or i don't have a conscious un like answer to those questions it's like a subconscious um thought of how i built it but I don't yeah, know but that's why I, that's yeah. why I agree with Natu. The project needs to go on the couch for a bit and right. have a little psychoanalysis to figure out what you've done, because I think it's full of intentionalities. It's not an accident that the circle faces the axes. And, you know, there, it's it's. I mean, whether or not you know it when it happens, I, I call author intentional fallacy. Like, the thing has <laughs> dispositions now that we could tease out. I think one of those, just to follow up on that is how much do you think this project is red? Because there's a couple moments that are highly mm. um, legible, like with the archway, and there's a couple others that are escaping me at the moment. Maybe the one twisted four square window that are like clearly archly architectural, pardon the pun, but then the rest of it are sort of like schmoo or geometric form or wave that, you know, come come sort of like from other case cultures or other ontologies. There's a couple that are architectural. And so I'm just wondering, like in this vision of the cacophony and ugliness, cacophony, I don't have a theory of ugliness, so we'll look up Mark Hudson's later. Uh, cacophony, I can understand is like disparity between elements. I guess I'm asking about like, at some moment in the cacophony, you recognize particular elements. Do you have a semiology of these forms that you would want to entertain, such as the arch? It doesn't have to be as, as, as lame as arch equals federalism, but there's a series of like iconographies on display here, and I'm just wondering how we're supposed to ingest them. Right. Do we care what it looks like as individual pieces? Yeah. As an individual piece, it might be beautiful repeated in a certain order, but if it's mixed together at the same time, it creates ugliness. For example, the arch. Arch can be used for making neoclassical buildings and it has been used, but in this case, it contributes in making an ugly element to the design. Mm -hmm. But then the other thing, so give me one that's not, so arches would be an example of a decorum 
an expected an, an expected sense of values that enable us to understand its presence because we have a, a rule book for it. The pointy thing at the bottom with the spikes coming out of it, I don't have a decor, I don't have a rule book for that. <laughs> so like how do how, like how do we understand that as being ugly or cute or you know what I mean? What's it, what if, what is my reading of the of the spiky amoeba? Yeah. Do you think? I, I think there are ones. I'm not I'm I'm just sort of like I'm trying to get a sense of the of the yeah. I think to me, so just based off of the materials, it reads, play with me, but I'll hurt you, right? Because it like <laughs> looks like one of those like crystal or one of those like plastic flexible balls, but it because yeah. there's like these sharp points, it like, I don't know, there's like a contrast in the materials that um, are going on here. This, I think this is why like this, like that, your point, John, is precisely why I'm like, why the materials, why the order, like why the placement, why, just why, you know, I, I don't know. It's a particular quality. It doesn't mean it's not good or bad. I think it's nice as a thing, but it's different than a pile of rubble. <laughs> like it's a pile, but it's a pile of things that are unalike and we don't have a category for them as a set. And so yeah. it's not like a store, you know, there's lots of things you could imagine would be a set of things. Like, um, yeah, all the elements of a museum put in a pile would be one kind of legibility. A bunch of basketballs put in a cage would be another kind of legibility. These seemingly, I went to every store in the mall and then outside and then to a lab and then somewhere else and then brought all that stuff together. Like it's a, it's a, it's a, universe of things that don't seem to have a i'm trying to understand has no limit or is that part of the argument yeah, yeah i think that what you said was the best um ideology and the process of how i combined my project and how i came up with the design in a very deep way combining different things at the same time with an unpredictability But that's where, I, again, I, I, to a certain degree, I would have been interested to see uh, other variations, not, not variations by taking this as a core and adjusting bits, but complete alternatives. Yeah. You know, I mean, I would be interested yeah, yeah. to see how far can you push it, you know, because yeah. without, without that sense of it, because it, it, for me, it gets to an interesting condition of, you know, if you have two there and we say, well, this one is even more ugly or uglier, yeah. then we can start to understand what it is that's triggering the sensibility of ugliness to it, you know? And so it, it reminds me, you know, there's this, this story of Duchamp where uh, Duchamp talks about, uh, I mean, it's in reference to a Chinese philosopher where you go into a riverbed and you're asked to find the most ordinary rock not the most interesting rock, but the most ordinary. And every time you pick up a rock, you realize it has an interesting little texture or it's got some flakes in it you didn't know. And so suddenly it's interesting. It's no longer ordinary. So for me, it would be, I would want to see five or six or 10 exemplars in order to say that is the ugliest. Because then I could understand that what are the conditions that are, that are generating that sensibility uh, in, in relationship, so to speak, you know? And again, yeah, not see. because it becomes compositional or becomes a methodology, but because it's what is triggering it. Because like I said before, you know, there's a, some architects here in Melbourne that design just like this, you know? I mean, for, you know, this would be a normal project for them. Uh, not at this scale and not as a proposition for a capital building. But, you know, if you look at AR, ARM, Ashton Raggett McDougall, a lot of their projects have this sensibility to it. So, you know, what what is missing? I mean, you know, if I just look at it very quickly, what what is not really present in the image that you that you have here is the uh, more organic. That is to say something that looks like 
the uh, the intestines of a cow, mm -hmm. you know, something yeah. that looks like uh, a squashed bug, and you see the insides of a big roach, you know, uh, something, you know, so the, the sort of more organic. So instead, you know, you've gone with what are fairly uh, inanimate bits and pieces uh, jumbled together. But what becomes really ugly, really revolting, and then I guess, again, these are, you know, these adjectives actually start to talk about a different sensibility. But when we talk about not, it's not just ugly, it's revolting. It's really pushing me away. Then, you know, what, what would that, uh, what would that uh, field of, of elements uh, entail? which I would suggest is probably the more organic that rather than, than the kind of uh, uh, inanimate that you've used. I think incorporating those more organic elements would, would push the project more towards like it being grotesque than ugly. I think, I mean, I personally, yeah, yeah. Like, the word ugly has a certain like, playful like abstractness to it that like cow intestines and like organic materials like like that to me would be like gross not ugly right um yeah well that thing i used not organic exactly but something like a, like right. a like, hair. i think when it comes to like materials you could probably play with bringing some of those like organic textural qualities into it but i think in terms of like form i kind of i i think the project sort of needs to stay more with like the unnatural or artificial type of type of elements if that makes sense um i'm gonna send a, like two influencers in the chat that i want you to look at because one of them like when I heard the word ugly and then I saw your project, immediately thought to her. She's, she goes by Ugly Worldwide on Instagram. Okay. Look at the project, look at her profile. You'll see exactly why I said your project like lives in the like ugly camp that is on, on the internet. Um, sort of like claiming ugly as a, as a new type of, of, aesthetic sort of or or a new type of um beauty okay thank you mm -hmm. any last comments so uh i would like to congratulate you and um i think it's been a great discussion and a very provocative project that enabled this discussion so thank you Shaitish. Thank you very much. So now we have exactly a seven minute break. <laughs> um, and we'll return, let's see, I guess that's 3.50 PM uh, Pacific Standard Time. So seven minutes, please promise to return because we're on a very clear schedule, thanks. We're on the five minute break. Right, so Donald, are you there? I'm going to steal you to that Zoom link that I sent you. Ah, he might have gone on the break. Okay, so I'm going to Yeah. if he was there. Thank you. So Patricia is coming back now, Marceline, okay, after the break.
Hi. Hi, Fongo. Yeah, hi. Good afternoon. So Elena will join us as well. Yeah, she busy with the uh, live uh, another one. Thank you everyone for being so timely. <laughs> it's like a dream seminar when, when you say we're gonna take a break and everyone comes back exactly on time. <laughs> but we're just waiting for Elena because Elena is uh, Pump Paul's advisor, so. Elena is coming. Donna, we'll start your interview later. I think we got delayed in our, our calendar. Donna, can you guys? Oh, he's putting. Uh, actually, we, this session ends before the other sessions. So we, we have four projects. Some sessions have five. So maybe Donald could go at the end. Yeah, Patricia is now coming back. So. So oh. Donna, we'll do, we'll do it later. Elena is coming back. This is the uh, Elena student, so we'll, we'll start. Okay. I'm at Sayark, so that's why. Running, you guys, it's a very familiar place. Running with the mask. <laughs> Might have to do a review with the mask. <laughs> oh, there she, there she goes. I see her walking. I see humans. Yeah, she's going in. So Pompo will be... Yeah, you can start now. She's almost there. Hello, oh. she's logging in. I think I can see from across the corridor. This is very unusual, no? <laughs> see other humans. I don't know my nine-year-old, my seven-year-old. How is the air quality there in the downtown? Is it At Sayark, you know, the sun is yellow, yellow. I was yeah. walking in the corridor, you know, you guys, uh, 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 room 60, um, towards so there, and the, 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 the lines of the sky is red. No, Elena, it's like red. I am here, I'm here, sorry guys. <laughs> no, no, it's kind of apocalyptic to be in downtown, and it's actually, actually invigorating to be at Sayark. I haven't been this happy in a long time. I think we underestimate um, the effect of being indoor, yes. <laughs> or maybe I've been indoor too long. How about that? Um, I, so, so I think we're all here, so yeah. uh, we can begin. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Perm Hon from MR2. You can call me Paul. Uh, today, I would like to show you my graduating thesis project. My project is to design the sustainable city for the future in the China. My presentation is all on the website. I will share the link for you now. And uh, Manuel, I am going to share the short video presentation. You can uh, watch direct from the link that I give you, or you can uh, watch, watch the Zoom.
A city is a large human settlement. It can be defined as a permanent and densely settled place whose members work primarily on non-agricultural tasks. Today, a global crisis, food security, climate change, and a waste crisis are changing our vision of cities, creating entirely new prototypes which integrate agriculture and city into one place. City X is a prototype of city planning that engages directly with agriculture and social communities to build a contemporary city with zero net impact. To reach this goal, City X will be built under seven key principles. A culture of community sharing, mass mobility, smart city technology, modular construction, urban farm, net zero energy, and zero waste systems. In April 2017, China announced Xiong'an as a new district to be transformed into a mega modern metropolis to rival Shenzhen's special economic zone and Pudong. This new district is around 100 kilometers southwest of Beijing. This prompt from China has been taken on as an architectural challenge by the Venice Biennale. This project will be included in the 2021 Venice Biennale as one possible proposal for the future of Xiong'an. The first step for City X is creating water circulation by digging the land to build a river and creek. Next is to build infrastructural systems and green space on the original ground floor, which will be changed to a service floor. It also includes the belt conveyor for a transportation path. When the systems have been set up, the harvest floor is created for agriculture and livestock. Rapid transit will be built next. There will be a station every 500 to 800 meters. The last step in setting up the city will be modular buildings, which can have many functions in the city, such as residential, commercial, office buildings, community schools, and sports centers. City X will not have a road as the main mode of transportation. Instead, the belt conveyor system will be a more powerful means for navigating the city. It runs together with rapid transit, for example, a self-driving float bus and a flying skateboard or scooter, which all use a maglev system to operate. City X will apply a collection of standardized self-development and smart architectural city models that explore possible solutions to urban agrihood, renewable energy, water management, and waste management. The city is designed to produce a variety of food to self-sustain our citizens and thus overcome a food security crisis. The urban farm includes livestock, fish, honey, poultry, and eggs, aeroponics, hydroponics, seasonal garden, a wetland garden, and a greenhouse. City X is designed to build a renewable energy system to provide many forms of energy, both biological and clean sources that derive from waste products and nature. Biogas will be produced from animal manure, and solar energy, wind turbines, water turbines, and heat exchange are examples of energy sources which stem from the environment. City X will use landscape to help the environment by creating a constructed wetland which utilizes plants to help filter or purify water. City X also has a wastewater treatment facility and a treatment swale to clean wastewater completely. Lastly, City X will create an alternative way of waste product treatment. Instead of destruction, City X will take all products to a recycling and reuse processing plant. City X will create a sharing culture in which all members can exchange or share goods. For example, toys, furniture, electronics, and cloth. City X is not a utopia, but a real urban proposal where new ideas about city systems may be tested and refined. This is Xiong'an. This is the future. Yes, and uh, next video, I'm going to present you the games inside of my website. It's about the learning uh, game in the city.
So the first level is about the uh, city transport system. That how you gonna get the anything. The second level is about the uh, your backyard. Like uh, you can uh, do the harvest on the back of the your housing. The third level is about the agriculture, learning how you gonna uh, produce the milk or the harvest the grass. The fourth level is learning city mobility, how you gonna uh, move from one to the second. That is an example of the game that I'm uh, show you. You can play more in the website also. So I'm gonna, that I'm finished to present my uh, this is now and I will uh, make the video rerun and then you can uh, comment. Okay. Just one comment um, before we continue. We've just been joined by Mimi Zeiger. And um, Mimi, I, I just gave a short introduction to you, but we asked all our critics to introduce themselves. <laughs> Would you mind just to... Uh, no problem. Uh, first, apologies for coming in late. Um, I'm a critic and curator based here in LA, and I am a faculty at SciArc uh, teaching a course this semester called Other Futures. Thanks. And if, if did you get the links, Mimi, in the chat, or can you see those? Yeah. I can give you... Oh, I can't see the previous chat links, oh, okay. but... Uh, Can you repost them, please? Yes, sure. Uh, Thanks. Um, is the game playable in this version on the web? I, I'm trying to like not split attention. Is the video you showed us of the game, is that a kind of proof of concept, or are you going to? Can we actually play it? Uh, yes, you can play it on the link that I give you. Yeah. And and will you? That's great. I want to play it. I'm not going to play it now because I want to talk to you. But can you just make sure it stays up for like another day or two so I can have a chance to play it? I think yes, that's yes. all very impressive. It's um, it's it's a it's a online twenty four how you can play uh, any. <laughs> but is the game conceptually? a way to learn about the city or is the game a way to like model the city or make the city? Like uh, it shares graphics with it, but I'm trying to understand. Yeah. Basically the, 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 the idea of the game is just like a learning how you gonna survive in this city. Like uh, for example, uh, if you are the new resident and you want to living in this city, you don't know like, because this city is very different from the the, the city mm -hmm. today now, like uh, the city, it doesn't have load. The city doesn't have the uh, basic facility as we living now. So mm -hmm. that's why I'm trying to uh, find a way how to present and how to uh, learn, how to teach, teach them know how to living in this city. Mm -hmm. Yes. Is the learning how to living in this. But I guess this is the thing that I find so interesting about the proposition, because it's, I, I love the graphics, I love the thinking, the video. I'm watching this thing, and it's like a kind of reminder of the last 30 years of good intentions in city making, like all of them. So some green fields, some mobility, some smart, like they all have come back and they're all gonna get synthesized in the project, which I think it's fine. I just sort of realized, oh, that's what urbanism is. It's a collection of best practices that come together. I'm just trying to figure out, 
Because at one level, it seems more rigid than a typical city. And in another level, it seems like you want to make it super flexible. So like there's the modular building and there's the game idea. And where it's like, this is where we're going to come and we're going to try new things. And so the whole notion of the city as an experiment. And then there's the notion of the city as something that's already there before you. And so when you say like, oh, I'm going to play the game to learn about the city, that to me seems like an older model of the city. The city precedes me. I come into it. I adapt to its logic. Whereas I feel like the promise of what you're talking about with the notion of the modular buildings and the, and the conveyor belts and things plugging in and out is like, the, I make the city as I experience it or as I live in it, I change it. And so there's a more, a possibility of a more interactive city. Uh, and I think for me, the game, the video is like by its nature instructive. It gives you something. But I think the game for me conceptually opens up another mechanism where it's like, oh, you know what? It turns out maglev um, scooters didn't work. So we're going to take that plug in away and replace it with something else. Um, and that's where I feel like there's a difference between your plug in city or your plug in buildings and the sort of the infrastructure seems very fixed in relationship to other things that seem very flexible. And I just wonder if there's a more open ended plug and play sensibility that could permeate the entirety of it. Yeah. <laughs> but it, I mean, uh, I, I hate dead air, so I keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, this is all to say I love it. Like, I think the graphics are really smart. I think the game's really smart. I think, you know, at this well thought out like both as a proposition and as a thing. So very impressive. Thank you. I'm coming in late. So you probably already answered this um, in your proposal, but um, what what happens uh, within this sort of world um, in relationship to crisis, right? I, I think this kind of goes to John's point about problem solving for the better good in relationship to um, kind of the large systems of planetary crisis. But I think, you know, what we're seeing sort of right now uh, in California and, and in other places, the kind of localized crisis, um, and does that sort of begin to generate uh, new conditions within the urbanism? Uh, and this this is sort of to the point of the, the flexibility that maybe goes outside of the parameters of sort of the large scale urban thinking. Mm. Um, at first, the idea of this city is uh, decide how to, uh, how we gonna overcome the situation that we force right now, like uh, the uh, uh, food crisis or the uh, climate change. So that uh, I'm look forward to build a city that not harmful to the environment and also treat the uh, people who living in the city to have all they need compact in the one city. That's why it's come to like uh, uh, the city that have their own production, like uh, the farming and the clean the um, water by themselves before get out of the city. That is uh, like uh, the, the main idea of uh, this city and then I move forward to how to uh, link the uh, social together by uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking so that that is become to the um, a culture of community sharing because the first of this concept is uh, uh, instead of we just uh, throw it away we just take it and reuse it again that's why it's uh, come to the idea of this city and this one is also uh, the new totally the new city so that is like uh, we can uh, completely decide the new thing into this project that is uh, uh, the first of the proposal of my project so um i guess this another way to say that is risk is not that this is not built into the game like, how, how do you fail or lose at the game? Uh, the game is, 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 is not 
it's not the have the fail. It's it's like uh, the game that will be force you to go to the direct way. It's not like an open game that you can game over or you can uh, need to restart the game if you do the do it wrong. They will uh, treat you and build you to go to the right way and make it right for the uh, for the project of the city. Like uh, if you want to uh, go the get the food from the from the uh, farming, you just uh, order it, and they not have another choice that you can do. They just have like a one or two choice that you can do, and it's like choice. That is like a, not 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 the not the open game that like a, in the online that you uh, can play. This this game is like a, the learning game that is a little bit uh, easy and uh, like a, you can learn it from that after you finish the game. <laughs> but the yeah, there's the question of the game, and then there's the question of the city. I mean, I want to be synonymous. You've told us that they're different. So I think maybe these questions also just go to the city. Like watching this, I date myself, but this is like the original Sim City, which was Axon based. Everything went fine and you had to really dial in a disaster to disrupt the system. Otherwise it was just like the care and feeding of the solid state system. And so as a city, does it, can it change in relationship to failure? Not even crisis, not even external crisis, but say there's too many eggs or not enough this. Do you have, is there a way that it can self-regulate? Uh, for now, the game is cannot do that way, but it's a good idea to, to, <laughs> to go forward, to do something like that, like uh, learn from the um, player and adapt it to the city. Yes, but for now, I the game is cannot... Uh, go to, to, to the, your point, yeah, because of like, uh, it's a lot of to calculate it. And also this city is, 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 is like uh, the future that um, the China plan to uh, looking and uh, maybe they can get some idea to build the real, uh, future city in the Shenzhen in the China also. That's why uh, this project is like uh, the open source and open research that they can get into what the future of the people thinking how they want to build a city. That's why it's like um, the, the, the open source of the um, government for the China that they can. Get in. I guess From, uh, go on. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay, so uh, I mean, from um, from like an urbanistic logic. Uh, also, by the way, I'm super compelled by the graphics and the way you present the project, the video, the way it's explained. Um, within your explanation or presentation of the project, uh, there's something that was um, quite confusing to me is the last part of your presentation where you uh, where you state that this is not like a utopian city. Yeah. Uh, I would kind of argue that I, I do think this is a utopian uh, sort of idea for, uh, for uh, urban development. Uh, but nevertheless, it seems to operate in a way where where it's maybe more um, efficient or coherent in a way. If it would, if it was to be thought of uh, maybe a plugging for an existing city, no, rather than as a, as a new development from scratch, no, it doesn't seem to be relating anyway to a sort of uh, a specific territory. So it makes you think of um, how can it operate as uh, this sort of utopian uh, plug-in to existing uh, cities, to, to existing urban developments within a utopian logic of operation within a very, um, let's say, efficient no? and uh, 
sustainable train of thought that could sort of be uh, well handled or received or sort of could cooperate to a lot of, uh, because most of the cities at the end, regardless of their location or so on, are dealing nowadays with more or less similar problems, no? and, the, and the sort of discussions uh, from the planning offices sort of address this logic of how do we deal with waste, how do we deal with energy, and so on. No? Uh, so you think of, um, of uh, certain cities that seem to have like their own plugins of very different realities of, 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 of the way the city operates itself. No, you look maybe like Christa, Christiania in Copenhagen, no? And it seems to be in a way like a plugin of that city it has nothing to do with the city, nevertheless, uh, sort of offers uh, a completely kind of utopian idea of a parallel universe. Uh, but in this sense, this is going straight into efficiency. So it would be quite interesting to see how this uh, sort of layout can become a more or less flexible plugging that could relate to more or less any urban center uh, in the world. Yes, uh, the idea of the um clean the waste thing that uh, I have put into the this project basically is use the nature to clean the nature. Like uh, if you have the uh, wastewater, you just uh, leak it the wastewater to the uh, grass field and the grass is gonna uh, absorb the some waste thing and clean the water and then you can drain the water out of the um, city or we use this again. This one is like uh, the, the the simple way that uh, we don't need to uh, build a, a new uh, technology or the 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 the, the a, hun a hundred of uh, million dollar to build a, um, the 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 the, medic, the 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 machine to clean the water. It's like uh, the simple way that uh, you can. Uh, get the clean water that is just uh, clean by the nature. It's, it's, it's like a, the simple way that you can uh, use it and uh, plug into the, for example, like uh, the city that is have the land available and then the land is uh, have the uh, wetland. So that's why it's, it's, it's like uh, this project is Locate near to the wetland, so I'm just uh, use this uh, idea to help this city. It will be same as uh, if you wanna uh, use this uh, idea to plug into the another city. Yes, uh, you can uh, just look the uh, the city that have the similar environment that can use it, and also the um, the energy like uh, this city is have the um, idea of use the biogas to uh, produce the energy. So uh, the biogas basically is come from the, um, the, 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 the waste product or the waste thing that is uh, from the animal manure or the something, some trash, some outcast, and we just uh, use the, go to the uh, vendor and uh, get the gas and take the gas to produce the energy like uh, to fill the uh, car or to fill the, um, the, 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 air, the, the electricity to get the uh, electric code. So that is like, uh, you can take this part, like uh, how to uh, get the, 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 the way, uh, I mean, uh, how to get the, uh, the, the electricity from the biogas to use to, uh, to the uh, another city like uh, the farming that they already have the uh, cloud to uh, talenting. So you just get the cloud uh, waste to build the gas to run the LED light in the warehouse, something like that. Well, Paul, I have a question. Um, I, again, sort of just to echo everyone's point, I think the graphics and the presentation you've given is, um, beautiful um but 
sort of looking at or comparing the the game version of the city to the sort of um, potential build, it, I'm wondering about, um, you know, this question of narrative. What um, are the citizens of, or what's like daily life like for the citizens of, of City X? Are we imagining that these are like regular people with like jobs or, I? because I mean, it, I feel like day-to-day -day activity would have to change if you have to go and get eggs from the chicken coop or, or um, you know, apples yourself from the hydroponic farm or wherever, right? So I think like if we start to think about like um, how people are going to live, do you imagine that um, there would need to be a sort of shift in terms of like home life, um, work life balance? Like, is it, or are you imagining that sort of the normal like nine to five is what, um, is how people are going to be living, right? Is there like a more sort of, um, I think Juan's example of Christiania in Copenhagen is a perfect example of that where the people that live there live like a very like free or freer lifestyle than the people in the immediate surroundings of Copenhagen, right? So are the people that are going to live in City X living in a different way than the rest of China, right? Mm, I can say actually the person who, I mean the, the resident in this city is uh, maybe a little bit different from the other city. Like uh, for example, we live in the Los Angeles. If we want to get the, uh, the, the egg or get the vegetable, we just go to the supermarket. But this one is will be like, uh, okay, instead of go to the supermarket, you just uh, walk to the backyard to get the uh, fresh vegetable. Or if you want uh, some product that you cannot uh, produce, it, it's like uh, the meal or the um, egg, you just uh, talk to the uh, your computer in the home and then they're gonna ship to you directly as you order from the Amazon right now. So instead of, uh, we walk to the supermarket, we just talk with the, uh, the home assistants and then they're gonna ship it to you. So okay. you don't need, you don't need to go to the, to, the, uh, to, the, to, the, to the farming to get the egg from the hen, uh, you don't need to uh, get the meal direct from the cow. But this one is will be, uh, but, but actually the meal and the egg is will be product in the city in the another location of the of the city but they're gonna ship direct to you like a 20 minutes or 30 minutes <laughs> but yeah, because we have the we have the uh trade that is uh, run by the uh computer to ship it to you. Right, so i'm gonna just give you some advice <laughs> you don't want to be in the egg promising business <laughs> so like i think there's a bigger vision than i can get you eggs in 30 minutes that you want you want to like own but there's a, but wouldn't it uh, it seems to me that uh, going back to what uh, natu was asking is what kind of citizens are they and the first or one of the questions i would want to ask you is this only feasible in a very authoritarian uh, community right. because you talk about it in terms of actually having incredibly controlled life, you know, that people have to act in a certain way. Not, you know, first of all, they have to pass the test by doing the game, yeah. you know, in yeah. order to learn how to live in the city. Right. And in terms of the amount of control that's exerted, mm -hmm. I mean, this makes perfect sense in China currently. Uh, but it seems to be that, that in order for it to have any operability, it demands a very top-down system to it. And the one or, thing, a system, uh, or a system where people are so homogeneous and so uh, focused on the good of the group over the good of the individual, in a way. Um, but it also implies a certain kind of stasis, that is to say, it's at a moment of complete fulfillment. Because what you don't show us is how did it get here? And what happens when it gets here? That is to say, what happens when you get 
too many people. I mean, you know, what happens when you get a few more people? I mean, and the difference, like, I mean, John talked about SimCity. I mean, one of the interesting things about SimCity is you actually had to start from zero and build your SimCity. And the more you put into it, the more compounding effects would go on. So you got a kind of, you know, a kind of uh, a wave where it starts out small, gets bigger, gets to a kind of optimal position, but it doesn't take very much to push it over the edge. And then it starts to have internal conflicts and you've got too much of this and too much of that. Yours, you know, which is very, you know, it's very plausible that you take it to the, the, the most optimal position, but, you know, it, it, in order to get to that position, it has to assume a fixity, you know, because uh, in order for it to be optimal in its production, it can't have too many people and it can't have too few people. It needs a certain number of people to be able to do the work. So, you know, it, it, it's almost like it has, everybody has to be helicoptered in at one moment for it all to just start and go. Right. Because I don't see, I mean, you do have a sequential. I mean, it's showing right here that first you put in the, the landscape and then you put in the road network and then you put in the buildings and then you so on and so forth. But at the same time, it's all happening everywhere at the same time, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to the traditions of a city. So if it's anti-traditional in terms of the history of cities, the question is, it seems to me, again, the solution or the way that's managed is by authoritarianism, that you have an outside source that like the military can plan it all in one go and make it happen in a very specific time frame, not let it evolve. So there's no evolution in this. There's only actualization. Yeah, I, I, I understand. Uh, I can answer you the questions about the resident who living here. Uh, for the job, they can be the anything they want. And the basically that uh, this city is can uh, give them is like uh, the um, facility that is like uh, they can get it from the city that that is like uh, the the thing that city give to them and they can be uh accounting they can be the uh any and any, any tally that they need actually act like uh, anything but this one is just like uh, instead of you go exercise in the gym, you just go walk to do the uh, farming, something like that, a little bit uh, di different uh, for, for the exercise of the people. I think the thesis is interesting because it's almost like um, an abstract diagram of urban planning um, or the diagram that we should have in order to develop cities uh, rather than having a plan and a zone map and a domination of what should be there. Now, it, 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 besides the proposal in itself is the complexity to which, um, how, actually how simple, how simplified could be human behavior uh, if there would be a diagram to try to delineate the most important ones and how that could inform um, urban planning decisions. Um, I'm just wondering if, if the thesis lies more on the diagram and the, the quality of the diagram, the capacity of the diagram to convey the complexity of your interaction, but also making it quite sterile and, 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 and normative. You know, this is how you have food. This is in which, you know, it, it's unthinkable that you would say that, but, um, but in a way tries to describe those activities that are quite complex uh, into um, an overall picture diagram. So, so, so to me, it, it, that, that is where the project becomes interesting um, when an architect tries to be an urbanist and uh, when uh, it does not rely on words, the, the kind of works is not, um, it's not a text on what the idea of city is. It, what is the diagram of the city when that is three-dimensional and goes beyond the problem of the building that goes into the dynamic quality of the uh, vehicular access, um, movement of energy, resources, um, use of the resources, etc. So to, to me, that's what uh, it's intriguing about the project and how then aesthetically um, put together that diagram starts to be. You know, uh, 
which maybe gives the idea that uh, this world could exist um, in an ideal state uh, rather than in a complex um, reality full of failures and um, unpredictable uh, relationships. But I, I guess to that point, I, you know, then it starts to question some of the assumed norms that are within the design of the city. Um, you know, we're looking at a, a kind of utopia and in within that um, bubble, uh, then the shape of the city could be almost anything, right? I, I'm, I then start to question, well, why is it on um, such a fixed like one by one grid? Um, you know, why, why, why does that make maximum efficiency? It may not, because um, that means every, every one of those blocks is a stop, right? Like maybe you want kind of a different sort of design. And so in a way, the aesthetics of it start to maybe undermine sort of ideas of um, efficiency or sort of a better life um, be because it starts to sort of set out this sort of rigidness um, but then I also think about like, okay, well, what if we just take this grid, um, which is, is flying kind of in the face of like efficiency um, and really pointing us towards kind of the pixelization of game culture. Um, and then think about like the cybernetics of Cedric Price and the kind of flexible, uh, or, uh, flexible buildings or sort of cybernetic sort of ideas that he's thinking about. So I, I wonder, can one, achieve a kind of utopian urbanism uh, without sort of the building in of a flexibility or without an acceptance um, that there is a conceit uh, in the very logic of this particular city. Mm -hmm. mm. I, I wanna introduce another vector at this last moment about time. And so not necessarily form, but time, because it does look like early SimCity to me and SimCity and cities themselves, the biggest, I'm going to be super trite here, the biggest design constraint of cities is permanence. So you put something here and then it has to stay and you can't put it there. And so as the system progresses, it becomes increasingly stagnant. That's what happened in SimCity because you locate certain things and then you deal with the fact that you can't move them. And that's the game of the city. So what I like or the promise of the city for me is not that it's a grid or not a grid or the, the, the actual locales of things, but the sort of notion of the modularity that things could be like unplugged at various junctures. And then you get rid of like the one uh, sacrosanct constraint of the city, which is permanence, which is, goes back to the Cedric Price thing. And that there would be a, a way of sort of plugging in and out like that seems really profound in a way. I'm not sure that's what you've, you do it for some of your building systems and not others. And I just think like an interesting path forward would be to like apply that plug in to the infrastructure as well as the buildings. Because then I think you've actually done something that's like quite novel in the conceptualization of history for cities, which is like displace its permanence. Yeah, duh, but duh. even those those modules. I mean, it's interesting that one that just was there. You know, the the graphism of the the presentation is that the modules are all the same scale, but the actual operation of what's happening on a module is a totally different scale. You had a you had one module that had two people <laughs> with a piece of trash or something, and next to it was a big power plant, which was exactly the same scale of the module <laughs> and such. And you know, the idea that that you know, you could move the modules around would then Im impact upon the very notion of what is infrastructure, because effectively you would have to imply that underlaying all of this is an infrastructure of infinite connections, that no matter where you put the power plant or the sewage plant, there's gonna be the connections underneath that take it back to where they need to go. So again, I think there's a question of the layering you know, that, that this sits on a kind of magic carpet layer, levitating these modules and you can kind of push okay. them around. But for their actualization, there has to be another layer underneath that, which is the underground infrastructure of infinite connectivity. Donald, I think that's super well said. 
I think he already implies it when he talks about his maglev scooters. Yeah, so there's exactly. a maglev <laughs> infrastructure, which yeah. has, is frictionless that allows yeah, everything yeah. to sort of slide. Yeah. <laughs> yes. well, I, I'd like to just poke in on just for a moment at the end of this one. So I've been advising uh, well, intermittently on the, just on the theory side. I was also confused at the beginning about how what the, where's the argument here, but I think in the end, uh, the obsession shows itself pretty clearly in the way he sh he demonstrates that this is a, this thesis is about aesthetics and communication. It's not about maybe any specific real uh, smart city, but about a kind of like I see it on, like the way it operates is kind of trying to make a convincing case to people who maybe aren't really ready to hear it. Uh, it's not so different, say, from the original document about garden cities from Ebenezer Howard, right? Like it's it was trying to evoke a concept to get help people get their head around it in a way that would have a kind of uh, embodiment that seemed accessible and made complicated things seem uh, seem sensible enough that you could get on board with them. And I think on that level, uh, he's constantly added new pieces to this project that that add uh, that try to add this kind of explanatory insistence on on that what is that kind of simplified Pollyanna smart city all the good things let's save ourselves kind of um, rhetoric that you know we're all familiar with but I think uh, in the end he's not owning that rhetoric he's owning a kind of way of trying to make that argument through graphics uh, and through these kind of various presentation modes including the game uh, that would be able to uh, to reach an audience that maybe isn't uh, able to understand everything that's in that package of, of a proposition. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Paul. And yeah. I just want to congratulate you. Um, and it, this has been a great discussion. So thank, thank you. you. Congratulations. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. So we now have our yeah. final project. Last but not least, uh, Wesley Evans. Hi. Um, so uh, I am going to do a few things. I'm going to put this link in the chat. And that's there. Um, and that's where I'd like you to go to watch my um, video presentation. Uh, and then I will also um, stream it uh, through Zoom. Uh, and I'll start that uh, shortly uh, after everyone opens the link. Thank you. Oh, I see you called me at 2.48 this afternoon, and I, I missed the call. I was before. Oh, I see you called me at 2.48 this afternoon, and I, I missed the call. I was performing. I didn't realize it. But, um, Call me back when you get time. Okay, I love you. Good night. Filling in the lowlands reclaimed by a rising ocean, a new geography emerges. A synthetic floodplain replaces only that which has already been lost to the sea. These similar volumes checker into an array of canals, pools, and locks which moderate and redirect the incoming tide. Using both active and passive systems of hydraulic conveyance, this network of structures made of distributed nodes establishes a computational landscape on and over which locally captured environmental data is transmitted broadly. Uh, my mother is named Donna and she is turning, I forget how many years old in next week. And then Robert is my father, but he goes by Bob. 
for the fam. Further inland, canyons are reduced to ditches and reservoirs to tide pools. The now earthen surface hosts irrigated islands of arable land, which are now bathed in fresh water from the interior. It is a homologous infrastructural lining woven between lower and higher shorelines. Um, and then my sister is Kayla. My brother is Garrett, or sometimes we call him G-Dog. Uh, Milled from timber and excavated from earth, the section reveals discontinuous masses unified by a discrete tectonic scale and recursive spatial profiles. The energetic scheme is also registered in this section, which contains the axes along which air and water will rise and fall, where power is generated. The surface features are repeated below on successively deeper levels to enclose a cellular spatial distribution. These porous masses encase a vast circulatory interior of intersecting channels and tunnels which outline pools and domes. Got Mother Janet, Father Don, and then get this, Danny Uncle, Donny Uncle, my mom was Donna, remember? These are architectural bodies. Inside, we live and assume many bodily configurations, including all social and domestic activities, none of which are productively laborious and all of which would constitute a paradigm of liberty through rest and pleasure. These public interiors encode a counterproductive spatial context by resisting the programmable planometric regime and instead resolving as textured and lively interior elevations at corporeal scales. The space of rooms is returned to halls and function, is dissolved into multimodal surfaces supported by the automated poche beyond. In contrast to universal space, these interior sites are unconditioned and unconditional, thus relieving these bodies of the burdens of productivity, architectural commodity, and the hierarchy inherent in serviceable spaces. All needs are met and services rendered by the enclosing architectural body. I'm in a big house on several levels or stories. There are these high ceilings, um, these big windows, uh, and it's nighttime. This is no rise a counter-urban infrastructural mesh that mediates a dense sprawl of post-labor communities which are mutually entangled across miles of networked regions. As a technical geology, the surface supports an open broadcasting platform that facilitates the recording, transmission, and retrieval of audio media. Data is encoded directly into the surface and can be broadcast both live and as an archive. The megastructures are not only decentralized, but also delocalized, such that differences in position are only coherent as they are specified by the relative distances between inhabiting bodies. Hi, so I, um, I haven't been sleeping very well, so I've been remembering my dreams. And my dream that I had this morning, I was buying a motorcycle, but it was so old and vintage that it had it almost was like a moped with two seats and the whole thing was metal and the tires in place of, of labor and tires, capital an economy of time and attention permeates the civic and creative discourse in our repose we speak into the walls with the intention of being listened to recording private and public thoughts onto the architectural surrounds we engage in a collective practice of documenting our oral histories and at other times we just listen an act of indulgence in alternative realities. Compared to the Whiting mansion in town, the house Charles Beaumont Whiting built a decade after his return to Maine was modest. By every other standard of Empire Falls, where most single-family homes cost well under $75,000. Sorry, uh, yeah, salad bowl. A salad bowl to mix the salad in, and I've got each pencil, just plastic ones, um... Um, the plate, the salad bowl, and a, maybe a couple of serving spoons. Okay. 
Talk to you soon. Love you. Bodies nested within larger bodies encode an infrastructural fabric that is organized by scale and resolution, as opposed to one shaped by territoriality and productive output. Here in the simple act of retreat, we are in passive conflict with the predominant modality of capitalist urbanism. This will eventually lead to a dissolution of these exploitative models and the sovereignties which legitimize them. If uh, everyone's back, um, thank you. What do you want to talk about? Wesley? No, we can hear you, John. This thing on? Yeah, it is. Wesley, yeah. what would you like to talk about? <laughs> That's a question. Mm -hmm. My audio is not working. Uh, no, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah, yeah. We can hear you. Okay. Um, hello? Hi. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Something was wrong with my audio for a second. You can hear me. I can hear you. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Cool. We might start talking. I'm gonna try one more time. What would now that we can establish communication, Wesley? What would you like to talk about related to your project? Oh goodness. Um, what would I like to talk about? Uh, I. Um, Surface hosts irrigated islands of arable land. Oh which are now bathed in fresh water from the interior. Sorry, hold on a second. Infrastructural lining woven between lower and higher shore lines. Oh. OK, hi. Sorry, there's mul multiple computers here. Uh, what would I like to talk about? I didn't expect to be asked that question. Um, I think this project uh, was, in a lot of ways, um, a way for me to explore um, uh, world building and storytelling through um, all sorts of like collaborative means. Um, sorry, I'm getting an echo on myself. Um, and so, uh, I guess I'm interested uh, to talk about um, uh, that. 
Sure. I mean, I, th I think I'm struck by the sort of like resonance or recalling like the films of Super Studio and the ceremony and all of these sort of notions of the blank space as a space that then gets refilled with intentionalities. I think here I'm confronted by the conflation of two Super Studio projects. There's others, but this is a shorthand. One is the sort of continuous monument in which there's a edifice of extraordinary size and labor that just appears. We don't know why, and it's just there, and we can react to it. And then there's the other one, which is a sort of the A to Z, or even better, the films, where people just exist in a sort of natural state, and we have no sense of like anything being there other than a direct relationship to nature. And so I'm curious, and this goes back to the sort of stories of emergence or becoming from the previous project, how are these things, how do these people find themselves in these spaces? Like, there's no sense of they, them constructing them. They come onto them as this kind of ruin. So I'm just trying to understand, is this something they happen upon and nomadically re-inhabit? Was there an earlier phase where they came together no, to build this so other generations could enjoy this moment? Like, what's the narrative? Yeah, I, 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 I mean, clearly didn't say in the, in the video super specifically, but, um, uh, you know, a little bit of the backstory, I, I'd say it's, um, uh, sort of, uh, part of some kind of, you know, really massive automated building process, um, by people it's, that are known, um, mm -hmm. but, um, certainly not by the people in this video. The people right. here are they, not, they operate as an inheritance of some other project. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I maybe to the to the point around Super Studio and how those projects operate as um, both proposals and critique. Um, I know that Bill, I've seen sort of various stages of this project. Can you take us back to sort of the point of critique that is built into this? project, um, which has to do around leisure and labor, I, I seem to remember. Uh, yeah, so that was uh, uh, kind of central to the, um, uh, the, the process for me was trying to figure out what a, what a post labor architecture uh, is like, uh, one that um, uh, it houses those who are, who are sort of living in some kind of um, uh, version of the world uh, where we don't work anymore, but also is itself not maintained by people ever, um, right? So like that there's also labor sort of like embedded in um, in walls and things like that and in floors that get cleaned and, but also sort of like the implications of um, particular spaces um, being ones that are like necessarily productive, even in domestic spheres like kitchens and things like that. Hmm. Um, and so uh, the idea was to see, part of the idea was to see what it would be like to try and like uh, get away from that and, and uh, to explore that aesthetically. Hmm. Hmm. So does that mean that th these images that we're currently looking at where the, not not this one, but the ones before, where you have uh, people. The the fact that the the spaces are so I don't want to call them neutral, but I mean they have no accoutrements other than slabs or surfaces. Mm -hmm. So that the absence of anything definable, like a chair or a table or a refrigerator or uh, a television or the stuff that most of us have he is somehow magically assumed within the walls and stuff which means that's why there's no need for somebody to clean the dishes there's no need for somebody to back in the floor there's no need to iron a shirt because somehow it's magically happening in a wall yes but I didn't but then so when you show, show us, no, sorry, no. just just to continue that, but I mean, uh, other thesis that I've seen today or yesterday, you know, somebody would have shown a, a kind of detail of how they made that happen or yeah. uh, show that there is a technology already existing in the world that allows you to do that. And therefore, we can imagine 
the consequence of it and doing it. It, it feels a little bit here like uh, it is because I say so. I don't actually have to design it or prove it or uh, take mm -hmm. it through the consequence of it existing. It's just going to be that way. So it's a kind of, uh, it, it, for me, it pr produces a little bit of a fait accompli project, which it is because I say it is. So mm -hmm. therefore it is. And then it's like, okay, well, it is. So you won. <laughs> Good. Mm -hmm. I mean, at the level of the world building, which I appreciate that, like, and I think one of the things about world buildings, you don't have to build the whole world. Right. You build part of it and implies the rest. I got no sense of labor. Like I got a sense of somebody built a big thing and then I got a sense of a bunch of people moved into it. And those people seem kind of dirty. <laughs> they're, they're, everything sort of seemed kind of dingy, seemed kind of messy and they sort of hung out. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't, I didn't get the sense that things were happening behind the walls. I don't mean that as critique. I just meant it as like a sort of like my reading of the narrative was a little less, yeah, post-labor mm -hmm. or no work. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know if it was post-labor or no work, I guess mm -hmm. is what I'm mm -hmm. saying. Like, here's yeah. this big edifice and it's sort of, for me, like a tale of squatters. Yeah. And yes. they're occupying it and everything looks a little dingy. Like the, you know, Super Studio is just a reference, but, mm -hmm. you know, in the ceremony video, they pointedly are wearing brilliant white in nature, which just means that they have a technological artifice that keeps them distant from nature, even though they're hippies and exploring it, where these people seem like they a little, a little unwashed. <laughs> and maybe that's just the color choice, but it, it did seem like they were squatters more than another kind of thing. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that I kind of imagined the, the experience of living here as a kind of um, like a uh, new Babylon style, endless squatting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it also doesn't, it doesn't seem like, uh, like quite a happy place. Like, a, <laughs> like this is a kind of, this is like a kind of a fleshy sponge city for sort of depressed people um and actually maybe that sort of is the the critique right that sort of uh given that this most of this was sort of conceived um under uh slow down shutdown um but i i think um in previous moments there was sort of more of that kind of interiority um drawn out um uh, into sort of questions of leisure, right? Like that leisure somehow no longer is actually quite fulfilling. Um, and that the architectures, as much as they're trying to sort of please us, um, don't actually sort of raise, um, sort of raise our quality of life. And, and so for me, I think uh, I've lost a little bit of that moment. Maybe I had only had that in my mind to begin with, but um, but yeah, I, I I do feel like there's there's something being said here that isn't a hundred percent articulated yet, mm -hmm. but but is um could be quite powerful. Yeah, yeah. Isn't there a scale missing? I mean, I mean, uh, for me, it's it's only got two scales. So this is like one to five, one to two, and then there's one to ten thousand, and so you have this giant thing that goes on forever which is at the scale of 20 million people, maybe 50 million people. And yeah. yet we only get two or three people at any one time. Mm -hmm. So for me, there's a real disconnect. I actually, I, I read, I mean, other than the fact that it's in the video, it's composited in the video, the two, the two moments, I have no way of placing this image into that other thing that's at one to 10,000 scale hmm. because there's nice sunshine here. There's water to take a, you know, to put your feet into, it's all kind of nice. But when I look at that one to 10,000, there are, you know, 34 levels below the surface of the sun where somebody, I'm assuming somebody is. I mean, I can't imagine that scale of production for a few inhabitants. It's almost like, you know, the, you know, uh, the last man on earth, you know, there's only five people in the world and there's this giant thing for them to wander around. But it's like after a point, because it's all repetitive, why would you even wander? Because there's nothing more to be found, you know, whereas at least in the last man on earth, it's about going to a new 
house and seeing what they've got in it and going to a new part of town and see, taking what's there and stuff. But here, the kind of monotony of repetition would, would not compel you to want to uh, do any adventuring because it seems like it's just going to be the same. Yeah. Yeah, there's something almost post-apocalyptic about it. I, I agree with my distinguished critic uh, colleagues here. There's something very strange in how unpopulated this massive span of what appears to be these kind of concrete blocks and also the notion of sort of being cocooned in one of those coffin like coffin scaled cubicles that would be buried underground. I mean, I just can't help but think, you know, you're either buried at sea or you're buried under the earth. There's something really uh, kind of hauntingly strange or melancholic, even the kind of sound of the narration there's something almost otherworldly about it. I think about movies like Gravity, where, uh, what's her name? It's not Julia Roberts, uh, Help, who was in Gravity. And she's hearing these voices coming. In. She's, thank you, Sandra Bullock. As you know, she's kind of tuning in these voices from afar. There's this kind of like, you almost imagine that these are voices that are being imagined by the people that we're seeing here. There's a very strange sense that you're coming upon a point in time after a major event mm -hmm. and I can't believe that these are structures that were made to improve or enhance the quality of life but rather we're in this kind of post something moment where mm -hmm. only a few people are existing but somehow the, the way that you've narrated it also creates a real kind of an emotional intensity. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, um, that again, it's almost melancholic or nostalgic. You right. know, the narration almost implies that these, these dwellers, these residents are, are somehow reminiscing another time. And, and, and that, 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 that kind of maybe eternal return or the eternal recall of that is a kind of is a kind of uh, is a kind of form of stasis mm -hmm. in a way. Uh, very curious, very curious, very um, there's a kind of disequilibrium to this whole thing. And I, I commend you for actually being able to create such a strong emotional arc. Uh, and I love um, Mimi's description of the fleshy, it was that Mimi saying fleshy spongy? Yeah, yeah. fleshy spongy is sort of like icky pretty, you know, the icky pretty fleshy spongy. <laughs> but, uh, but you've really created quite a, a, quite a strong uh, kind of emotional, um, em emotional uh, 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 kind of environment for us to experience here. And, and a large part of that, as I said, is the way that you've narrated it. Yeah, I also think um, sort of including the element of the sound bites between the narration really helps with um, what Patricia is talking about. And, um, you know, really sort of this notion of people aren't doing anything, they're talking to the walls is like almost maddening in a sense, like, like depressing, but also like you start to sort of start to like lose it a little bit and have to like, I forget what film it is where there's um the protagonist is like recording his history or, or telling his story to be found because he's like stranded. Um, it's escaping me right now. But this this sort of these structures almost seem like um, you know they're happened upon and the people that inhabit them like feed feed it their like their their stories or or their thoughts or whatever. And, and that's it, that it's sort of like housed within the walls or just the system itself. And it becomes this like infinite archive for whoever's left on the world post whatever event has happened, you know, and that there, that these histories sort of go beyond the people that um, experience them, right?
going back to Don Donald's question about the two scales, which I thought was a really interesting observation, I think the world making also parses along those lines because I think there's one version of this where you only watch the first half of the film and I think you get a really different reading of it which, mm -hmm. which is really has to do with like structural continuity against long surfaces and the relationship from the oceanic to the geological through the section where sometimes it's exposed and sometimes it's buried and the crypt like not in a sort of funereal sense but in a sort of like building underground sense I thought that was all very interesting and then I may have misheard it but then with the color palette, it also, I got it that it was wood or something. Like there was a, some weird materiality, which I don't know, like was already a kind of, I like that moment a lot because it didn't really imply anything about post work or even in habitation. Mm -hmm. Just the notion of a wood structure being that big, at least as an architect, um, blew my mind. Because <laughs> it was like, that's a really big wood structure. Like, you know, it was sort of like a kind of surreal, uh, a very particularly attuned architectural surreality to think that you would use wood underground, you would use wood in the water, you'd use wood for quite that continuity. I thought that was actually like less about this sort of like post labor inhabitation and more about a kind of like of the world after us, which was this book from like 15 years old now, but like what would happen after human inhabitation and things would revert back to nature and do weird stuff. I also thought the image of the, structures in water was really interesting because it looked like the buildings went up and down like you just it wasn't clear if we were seeing tide or we we're seeing movement i don't know what that means and i don't know where that goes but i think at some level i'm just more interested in like striking imagery being proffered which i think is at this larger scale yeah and then at the smaller scale it's not that i don't like it it's just a different thing and i feel less strongly about it yeah, I think there was there was even in the narration at the very beginning there was something about hydraulics, and that's why I, I thought the buildings were they were moving up and down. It was only later when we get that section that we realize it's the water level that's shifting. Because I actually thought the buildings were necessarily on hydraulics and they were able to adjust to whatever height they wanted to be relative to the water or to the land. That's what I thought was going on at the beginning. Yeah, the, well. the idea was that they are pumps. I that was said in the, they're, they sort of um, are hydraulic actuators in and of themselves. So the spaces that are enclosed between the buildings are actually, um, the water level inside of them is managed. Oh, uh, I see, right. But it's not the building out in the ocean being able to like a jack up rig it can go up to get itself further and further out of the water or get closer to the surface of the water. It's really the water level through uh, climate change that's changing. Yeah. Hmm. Wesley, what is the materiality in your mind? Uh, so uh, specifically, I, it was a quick line, and I think I should have drawn a little more attention to it, um, is that it would be um, where it starts intersecting with the earth, just carved out of it, and where it is um, not intersecting with the earth, but sort of like intersecting with the ocean, would like a boat. Um, but actually, like uh, uh, giant uh, blocks of cross-laminated timber that get milled out, but you have to keep the center to make a smaller version of it and you build up your whole thing after that. So sort of a, yeah. But it's more like pilings than boats because it's not floating. It's actually right. situated on the yeah, uh, yeah, ocean absolutely. floor. So it's more like kind of pilings or, yeah. or yeah, piers. No, that's, that's true, yeah. yeah. Hmm. Did you take the pictures of the models? No. So those are all people that I know who I um, had take pictures of themselves. Okay. But but they're so, posed for you. They made their own poses. I just asked them to take a lot of pictures and gave them some instructions. Um, 
but they are Mr. for me. Yes, they're for me. Yeah, I mean, Mr. Post Labor, you know, <laughs> you ordered the photos. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I, uh, and the you know, voices are also. Uh, the director I doesn't develop the film. He, people. Yeah. After the shot. <laughs> Interesting. I mean, I, that, I mean, again, for, for me, this is almost two different projects. There's the big thing, and then there's this stuff. And when you get to this stuff, and then you do start to talk about uh, post-work, post-labor, then I become interested in the actual images uh, to the degree to which there looks like there's no labor involved. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, when, when somebody looks like they're exercising, you know, that's kind of labor. Uh, when somebody looks like they're uh, doing something. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I don't know it well, but, you know, in uh, uh, Judaic culture, you know, with the Sabbath, the question of what is labor versus what's not becomes quite interesting. So when I look at those images, I try to figure out when people are kind of languid laying out on these, they look like they're at the beach side, that looks like non-work or non-labor. But when they start doing stuff, then it starts to look, like labor. So I, I'm interested in the degree, the degree to which you edited what images are here and what you instructed your friends to take photographs of themselves doing in order to imply that notion. And, and you know, what are the stages of characterization, which is, that's what I would, you know, I, I think the, the debate about on the Sabbath, when are you working and when are you not? <laughs> Uh, you know, in a kind of Talmudic way, becomes amazingly hmm. complex about what is described as work and what's not. So it would, I would, have been sort of interested to see that played out more uh, in the in both the research, but also in how you activate it in your images mm -hmm. and what you choose to show and how you show it. But also a really important distinction: what is the difference between leisure and what is the difference between leisure and boredom? Right. I don't see any of these people as having leisure time. Leisure time is only leisure time if you really have something to do. There's nothing for these people to do. They just seem in this state of perpetual boredom waiting for something to happen. It's really, it feels really sad to me. It's, it's, it's um, you know, it's not leisure in the sense that you have time to read a book or, you know, put your, put your feet up on a table with a tall gin, you know, tall glass with, filled with gin and tonic or something. These are people who are like, look like they're almost losing their minds in a kind of group solitary confinement or something. There's really some they're strange psychological the, thing happening here. They're talking to the walls. They are losing it. They they're, are losing it. They are absolutely losing it. This is not leisure. <laughs> it's not well, leisure as we know it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I would actually agree. I think it, it certainly, it, it isn't, and it, it can't be because of the lack of labor. Um, at least in as far as we can, as far as I personally can comprehend, right? Um, it they they seem to be um, one is one seems to be sort of capitalizing on the other, so to speak. So, um, in in that sense, yeah, I mean, it 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 kind of um, it 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 doesn't really look, uh, you know joyous in the way uh, <laughs> perhaps the project right i mean it's funny that's, that's not to say i'm not uh, it's not like an it's, it's still an optimistic project uh, yeah. in many ways for me yeah. i mean i guess it's optimistic in the same way like squatter punk uh is optimistic right like that you get to make your own world within some sort of uh shell of something else right and mm -hmm. then uh sort of reject a status quo um, that may or may not have been there in this case. It's funny seeing and hearing it uh, come together the first time. I mean, we've been seeing pieces of this all semester as it evolved and as photos came in and your friends were able to photograph themselves according to those instructions and then collages were made and then models were, physical models were made, images of physical models, then those become other images that are part of this animation. So there's all this kind of other 
media that now has uh, a place. And it, it's kind of, um, I thought, very impactful when I just hearing the voice uh, component, which we didn't hear ever before. Now that that accompanies the project, it's really bringing to mind like Aldo Rossi's Cemetery for the Ashes of Lost Thought. And this sort of, there is a kind of, a little bit of a melancholy um, idea of the humans that existed on this earth and what has happened. I mean, obviously the references to the climate change and the water levels, um, but that really comes across now. The other reference that, that Donald Bates will know, I think is, uh, Woman in the Dunes, which oh. was a book by Kobo Abe mm -hmm. uh, about the um, entomologist in the living in the sand kind of pit in this. And I really, I've always thought of that with this project. It's kind of like multiplying that. So um, yeah, I, and third one, Metabonate Floating Factory, one of my favorites um, by Kisho Kurakawa, which is like a circuitry that is a kind of model for, for floating city, but it looks like a circuit board. So it was a whole discussion of hardware, software, and how we might visualize as architects information technology in, that was in 1969. Um, but when I saw your kind of circuit board and the computational landscape that you describe, I think that's really powerful. So there are a lot of different um, projects and references that resonate. And I think, uh, I just think you've made a really impactful work and it's it's not an easy work to kind of unpack. I mean, I, I admit as well throughout the semester, we talked so many times about it and each time different things kind of surfaced and, you know, and I still don't know if I fully understand um, or if you fully understand or, but I, I think that uh, I would really commend you on um, this kind of really important body of work that you've produced. Absolutely. Yeah. And if there are no closing comments, then maybe that is a, a congratulations. <laughs> Thank you, Wesley. Thanks. Thank you all so much. Appreciate it. Thanks, Wesley. Awesome. Oh, really ambitious project. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, I will, I'll cut the live stream, but I just want to announce one thing. Let's 